Good evening, Gabby. How are you doing? I'm okay, and welcome all to part five now, isn't it? Of it uh, is, yeah. the year of Book Corner, which originally come out of um, the current view, uh, the the yeah. regular weekly podcast that we do, and then through social media we come up, uh, come across each other because you have a wonderful presence on social media promoting so many fantastic books and i just said fancy doing a podcast together yep why not yeah. this is the fifth one so for listeners that don't know about myfootballbooks.com just briefly yeah. tell us all about you and what you do okay excellent well thank you for your kind words firstly so yeah my football books um got our own dedicated website so www myfootballbooks.com I'm also on Twitter at myfootballbooks Facebook and also Instagram for the younger uh, listeners out there Uh, and uh, yeah my football books came about uh, with COVID-19 the lockdown when it started God it feels like a long time ago now doesn't it when did it start now summer of 2020 it was around about uh, yeah two years ago Mm -hmm. so I had a bit of time on my hands I was was made um, uh, oh I forget what what they called furlough that's it yeah yeah that's it. The word I've never heard of before, and everyone talks about it now, but I was furloughed. Yeah, so I had a bit of time on my hands, and my favourite pastime has always been reading football books. And uh, lo and behold, an idea coming to my head. I thought, oh, why don't I share some of the books that I read? And, and it just evolved from there. And now I've got a website where I talk about recommended books that I've read, but also ones that's uh, new released uh, and that's coming soon as well. So, uh, but um, yeah, so if you follow me on Twitter, and through the other channels and look at the website, you'll be able to get an idea of all the range of fabulous books that cover all parts of the beautiful game, as you know, Gabby. And you can also subscribe to uh, to Andy's you website. Can. You then get a newsletter every month, which is fantastic. Your website yep. is off the scale. It is absolutely brilliant. You decide your, you. your own icon. Uh, it's all your, your designing. Uh, I love the mugs as well. And your bookmark is still on page 105 of Granddad, <laughs> What Was Football Like in the 70s? Excellent. <laughs> so, God, so, it's still firmly in there. <laughs> it, it, ain't, it ain't moved, mate. I've been so busy with uh, doing my research and et cetera for my podcast. Good. So apologies, yeah. Richard Crooks. It's a fantastic book. I uh, love the picture. Uh, of the cover with Pelé playing F Santos against his beloved uh, Sheffield Wednesday, uh, the football yeah. book, the glasses, and the uh, the coffee cup as well on the table in a true seventies iconic uh, front cover, and on the back is the FA Cup final of nineteen seventy three, the program Leeds yeah. versus Sunderland, and uh, Sir Alf Ramsey holding the globe and a red card. I don't know what the red card's about. I must ask Richard one of these days. No, I don't know. But we did reference when talk about the uh, book corner on the current view. And I'm just going to go back to uh, part uh, 103. So this is last month. <clears throat> you uh, sent us uh, some at Busby, the men who made a football club by Patrick Barclay. Oh, you, yes. Then the week after, you gave us, I believe, an end of innocence, the watershed season, 1959-60 by Tim uh, Quelsh. The week after, you sent us uh, Destroying Angel, Steve Bloomer, England's finest yep. football hero by Peter Seddon. And then you kindly sent us uh, <laughs> from Radford to Roger Osborne when the FA Cup really mattered yeah. that was volume 2 there's 3 in the trilogy this was the yes. 70s by Matthew Eastley and we didn't do one last week because A I had parents evening and B Terry <laughs> had a problem with his knee uh, <laughs> so so we we gave Brilliant Orange by David Winner a shout this week for last week's podcast so those are all the books that you've sent us in the last month of recording yeah. the current view with the Idle of Hillsborough at Mr. Terry Curran. What books have you read this month? You know I haven't, but what have you? <laughs> I'm guessing two, maybe three? Yeah, I've got two or three I've uh, done uh, since we last spoke. So I've got one I've just recently just started, um, which is, uh, I'm only literally a few pages into it, called Part Life. It's a book with the sent yeah, to me. It? 
Uh, have you seen it? Yeah, yeah by yeah. Peter Roberts. Um, uh, I've communicated a few times through Twitter, but it's um, it's focused on Sunday League football, which is uh, well, I think anyone listening here uh, will have fond memories of Sunday League football, watching or playing it. So, uh, and it's uh, it's a it's a brilliant read, and it's based on the four seasons of Ronda football. Okay. Hopefully, I pronounced that right, uh, correctly. Uh, Rondo and Wales. Yeah, uh, sure, which that's it. Yeah. So uh, north, and it's ri- it's the north, is it? Mm. Excellent. Apparently, what it talks apparently about. I've got relatives in the Rondo Valley. Apparently. Oh right. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So my dad tells me. Yeah. <laughs> you can pronounce some of the words better than me, then. So my Welsh is uh, not uh, not brilliant. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but no, it's about celebration of the Sunday League football, as it's obviously a million miles away from the prima donnas of the Premier League, and I'll just. I already it's getting stuck into it. it brings out so many memories when I think about Sunday League football as well just great times I can even think about now when I'm with my friends we always talk about that game from years ago etc when we won it in the last minute on a mud pitch and all that etc so but now it's um, yeah it looks fascinating book uh, and I love these kind of books as well it's <clears throat> away from your your traditional uh, or let's say your famous stories but so many people associate with these kind of uh, you know, the words, etc. Here, and he puts in here about it's provided in the best of times, uh, Sunday League football, and uh, yeah, I'm sure that will echo for many people as well. So, yeah, that's <clears throat> part life by uh, Peter Roberts. So it's out through uh, your loafer books, and I'm sure I've pronounced that wrong as I've already just said. <laughs> I think they're a, a Welsh publisher, so yeah, part life. Um, one I did finish uh, recently, um. I started it some time about for whatever reason and I, I didn't finish it. I come back to it. It's called "We Lose Every Week." Uh, it's the history of football chanting by a guy really? called Andrew uh, Lawn. Yeah, it's come out through, through Ockley Books. It came out not last year, I think it was the year before. Uh, so it's yeah, the history of football chanting, and uh, and also from the title it doesn't really sometimes probably I'm not sure it does it justice. It's a brilliant, brilliant book. Honestly, I really recommend it. It's fascinating because it, it covers um, yeah, how football chanting has evolved from Victorian times and then uh, through the years. It covers so many areas from uh, in terms of how like, society has impacted football, political as well over the years, etc. And also how it's impacted how football fans behave and how they sing, etc. Uh, wonderful stories like if you ever Google them um, YouTube and you'll see the cop at uh, Anfield when they're singing uh, She Loves You uh, by the Beatles. And you just get a flavour in terms of like the, um, you know, the kind of atmosphere, et cetera. But it's a, just a great story, yeah, taking you through a number of uh, areas. Touches on things like racism as well. So when uh, racism is used in chanting, et cetera, as well, which is obviously abhorrent, of course. But, uh, uh, and how things have changed and how people have got more and more creative. And, yeah, you love it when you go to a game, don't you, and you hear that chant and... You know, there's nothing better than a good atmosphere, is there? Uh, I think there's some fantastic yeah. football chants. Yeah, yeah, they're brilliant. Some of the songs that they make up, the fans, they yeah, are brilliant, aren't they? Oh, and, the hu- and that's what he touches on here as well about the humour as well. Yeah, and it's a real good humour, and you get that from the two fans as well when they when they're bouncing off each other. It's really good, isn't it? When they they are literally are bouncing, they most and there are people there are literally. Uh, probably the only ticket interest in the game. And <laughs> they're just focusing on the away fans and vice versa. But so uh, you just think about even this time last year when you didn't have any crowds, did you, with obviously COVID, etc. It just shows how much, well, it was planned to lead uh, the best, wasn't it? Watching the football on telly, there's no one in the ground. I know lots of the players talked about it, didn't they, at the time, etc. It was soulless atmosphere. But um, no, it's a brilliant book, History of Football Chanting. It's, it's, so it's a part history but in linking it to, yeah, football fans. So, uh, yeah, and obviously, as we all know, football fans are so important um, to the, yeah, to the actual meaning of the game, really. Um, and, uh, yeah, a number of great stories in that. And then one of what I mentioned that I've read this month is called um, A Straggling Life. Uh, I think I've mentioned it before, but it's Andrew Watson. Yeah, I've got that. Um, yeah, sort of, saw the, uh, the world's first black... Uh, international footballer. So, for those who don't know, um, was a Scot- Scottish um, international footballer, son of a uh, plantation owner, uh, and uh, yeah, so fascinating story. One of these that's very 
uh, wasn't it's famous in Scotland areas, but uh, but not so well known um, further afield really, because uh, it's famous for part of the teams when they uh, thrashed England um, in the I forget where exactly when it was, uh, but it's all based on original research and it's written by Lou Walker and it's from the the great guys at Pitch Publishing. So it's yeah, he was known as a Scotch professor. So you're probably familiar with the story as well, Gabby. I think you may have heard of it. I think we talked about it before, haven't we? Yes. Uh, um, I think they stumbled across <clears throat> the story, didn't they? Because um, A, he was black. Yeah. B, he played for Scotland. I think he captained Scotland as well, didn't he? He did. You know, it's a did, fantastic yeah. story. And, um, and, you know, history. I love history. Well, football history yeah. in particular. Uh, Park Life, by the way, Blur made a great record of park life as well. Yeah, it did. Yes, uh, and, it did. And you, you did reference grounds being emptied and fans are back. We can't wait to welcome you back, was the cry from the football clubs. I'm sure there's some football clubs now wishing that we were still in lockdown. Reading is one that, that springs to my mind. <laughs> <laughs> the fans surrounded the coaches and wouldn't move, would they? Uh, no, uh, last no. Night. Yeah, so yeah. You know, football fans are great, but I think football fans also um, can can um, shall we say cause one or two little problems. Yeah, and that's been suddenly a little bit. I don't know if it's a little bit of that seems to have crept up a little bit recently. Yeah, when I think of the um, there was Leicester fans at the Forest game, wasn't Absolutely, it? Beforehand, yeah. I mean, you had that fan run on, yeah. and then you had was it Derby Middlesbrough? Was yeah, there was, was last there was about weekend. Seventeen arrests up there. Yeah, in, that's yeah. it. Some people, I just, I never understand it. I think you're the same as me. Yeah. There's lots of people listening in. There'll be, um, some people take it just far too serious. Um, I don't know how to explain it. It's, you know, it's after all, it's football, it's sport. Well, football, but I think people, atta- people attach themselves, don't they, as well? But yeah. have, they're not real football fans anyway. Well, the problem these. is, they actually are. And, you, you know, um, mm. through my association with mm-hmm. Birmingham City, I, I know yeah. quite a few of the, um, Infamous Zulu warriors, and yeah. and some of the great kids. I mean, I've had yeah. really an argument with most of them for uh, you know certainly on social media because of my support of Jack Grealish and just football. And I post up all <laughs> things football, and when I post up something Aston Villa, there's uh, quite a little bit of abuse that that comes my way. But I do know <laughs> right. a lot of them, and they are great kids. But they're just yeah. they're just barmy when it comes down to football. They tend to, you know, fans go to places and take substances <laughs> you know yeah. some of them are legal and some aren't <laughs> shall we say and then get involved in lots of trouble but I do think you have probably find that the more hardened crew and element don't particularly do stuff like that it's almost no. like a job you know and, yeah. um, be- between the firms I think that you know it's, it's quite well organised it's always been very well organised and I think there is a code of conduct. I've never been involved in any football violence, but following Birmingham City since I was seven, um, football violence is something that's followed my club around, unfortunately. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, you can get out of it if you can. I certainly did. I don't want to get yeah. involved in that type of behaviour. I'd rather have a drink with the opposing supporters, <clears> uh, talk definitely. about football, and uh, see, see you next time we, we play. Yeah. <laughs> we'll have a pint in the same pub. And I'll come to the away games and we'll uh, we'll uh, hang out together and uh, let's just enjoy the beautiful game. Yeah, there's some books out there, actually, that um, uh, done by, uh, I think, when you think of Zulu Warriors, I'm trying to remember, is it a one-eyed bath? Yeah, yeah. Was, great, um, lad, great lad, pal of mine. Yeah, it came across really well in the book, kind of thing, but yeah, obviously, um, mm. probably not, the, yeah. But again, yeah, it's just... Uh, it, I vaguely remember this years ago. I read it, so uh, yeah, absolute, yeah, just... absolute gentleman. Spent quite a yeah. bit of time with Baz a few years ago uh, in Isarinu in in Turkey. We were on holiday and we had a couple of meals together. You could not yeah. wish to meet a nicer guy than uh, yeah. Barrington Patterson. What a fabulous man! And that's what I'm saying. I know quite a few of them boys and. They don't yeah. go and get absolutely off the skulls and stuff like lots of these do. But, I mean, yeah. where, you know, it, it's it's something that, you know, you don't want to get people into trouble. So I'm not saying whether people are still active or not, but it's yeah, common yeah. knowledge that there's 
you know, people with their, you know, the Forest executive crew and the baby squad and and, oh, yes. and what have you. Yeah, so far, and, yeah. and books yeah. that have been written about those times back in the day. Yeah. And, and you know, the, it's uh, football has always thrown up that attachment to it. But again, I it will does. echo them words that I do know many of them. And the ones that I know are some of the nicest people you yeah. could ever wish to meet. It's yeah. just that it's just the way they see things. So yeah, let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, but football fans, you know, in general, yeah, it's um, well, they what they what make football, isn't it? Especially in the grounds, of course. Without the fans, so. it is nothing really. If we're absolutely honest, because when you see a goal scored and the fans celebrating. When there's yeah. a goal scored and you don't see the fans celebrating, it ain't the same. And and I do think that you know it's it's always been involved in football. It always will be involved in football. And I think that if you do go to football, it is unfortunately a side product and um, that, that you have to kind it's, of and you lose. And I love that because yeah. going back to that book I mentioned, the one that I've been reading, in the history of football, we lose every week. Yeah. You know, you kind of you're joking at yourself, aren't you? And I think that's another thing. Can't take it too soon. We lose every week. We carry on. But I think it was things like um, I remember actually reading back in the book where uh, it was Sir Bobby Robson was just saying, uh, "What's a club in any case without the fans, etc.? Mm. The noise, the passion, you know, the feeling of belonging, isn't it? The pride yeah. of being part of your city and yeah, yeah. all things like that. Football's people, life is people, and yeah, it's all connected. Absolutely, and we're all different. <clears throat> and some of us take that tribalism <clears throat> to the extreme. And some of yep. us don't, and and that's just the way that it is with football. But um, yeah, pick the bones out of that, kids, because you're never gonna. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, excellent. What else have you read, mate? Uh, well, but today the main ones I've read um, this uh, this month. Um, I think I'll to touch on on my newsletter. So thanks for mentioning that earlier. Um, I'd send one out. On the 1st of every month, so the one will be coming out on 1st of February, but the one um, going back to 1st of February, I, I picked out three <coughs> recommended books there. Uh, and one of them I'll mention is by John Nixon, uh, and it's called Can We Have Our Football Back? Uh, and John Nicholson is um, a well known writer, he's, he's won a number of awards, long listed for Writer of the Year, and he writes for the award winning website Football 365. Right. Uh, and this book, yeah, it's brilliant. Can we can we have a football back? I've got my own signed copy from John actually, um, and um, yeah, and it sums up probably a lot of what we just touched on actually. A lot of what people think the way of Premier League now uh, and how it's affected football, the greed, the money, probably the lack of uh, competition, the focus on the word product as well. Yeah. You know, and it just drives on you, doesn't want to say that. You know, it's a product now. It's a business and all that. It's, well, it's just, yeah, shows how it's changed. But this is a brilliant book. And he talks about, and what he, did, he is very clear of saying in the outset, because you, you start reading, if you just like flick through it and maybe read far through the book and then to the end, you'd think he'd hate football, but he's not at all. He loves football. Mm. Uh, you know, he's passionate about it. And his, his passion starts back from the 1960s, if he writes, you know, early in, in the book. Um, but, yeah. It's how things have changed, but it's wide ranging. It covers a number of, of myths, really, basically, um, in terms of. Um, but also touched on things like gambling, how that's come into the game, yeah. and things like that. Are some of the things that's, um, yeah, not um, quite how you'd want them to be, really. And illegal just how it's payments. Changed over time. Illegal payments was that in? Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah, that went back exactly. to the 50s. <laughs> yeah. And probably yeah, the yeah. 40s and the 30s. And yeah. The 20s. <laughs> Again, <laughs> it's always been there. I mean, we do, we do kind of, we're shocked in about the behaviour <laughs> of certain people in the game, but it's yeah. always gone on. There's always been a type of hooliganism, a type yeah. of attachment, a type of tribalism, a type of gambling, illegal payments. I've done a lovely too good to be forgotten with um, Colin Mallon, yeah. who uh, wrote the Len Shackleton story, The Clown Prince of Soccer, Len's biography. And also, when I'd done a podcast with uh, Neil Palmer uh, about Trevor Ford, um, mm. he was telling me how Sunderland used to pay those players, and Trevor put his, in his autobiography, he mentioned it, and he got a ban 
uh, from playing in this country <laughs> and had to go and play elsewhere for uh, towards the end of his career. But the uh, Sunderland director would take them for a game of snooker. Are you any good? No. Do you want to have a... We'll put 20 quid on this game. And the player always won, of course. And that's yeah. how they illegally paid it. <laughs> and it's always gone on. And, yeah. and it always will go on. My old man used to tell me about when he used to play football and they'd stick some money in your boots. You know, so, yeah. you know. again, it, it's all... I don't know why we really are shocked. I, I think it's... We've got to watch the extremes. But, you know... Get in our game. Yeah, back. I think... I'd love to have it. I wrote a poem. Give the working man back his simple game. Football has changed through the years, but again, yeah. you could argue that it's progression and it's just gone. It's gone too far from the age of the Jimmy uh, Jimmy Hill and uh, George Eastham and Trevor Ford and players like that that were looking Absolutely. to get rid of the maximum wage. It's probably gone a little bit too far, and it needs to be push back a little bit so you know I've yeah. never got a problem as long as the fans are not outpriced and that's been my problem that fans yeah. have been outpriced so you yeah, know absolutely. I'm not bothered about and, money in the game just make sure the fans are looked after yeah and this is what it talks it's the extremes this is what the talk yeah, yeah. this book talks about can we have a football battle it's talking about the extremes of the, of the money and it talks actually in the back says what what do we want now he's put some recommendations here like about the Introducing possibly you know its maximum player wage per year. Um, it does cool. say about games, mm. putting games back on BBC One, ITV, etc. And I, I, you know, it's never going to happen, is it, with no. Sky, etc. But no. you know, when you watch the FA Cup, what for a few weeks back, etc. How brilliant was that? You know, you could watch all the games on BBC, on ITV, etc. And uh, yeah, obviously, you don't you don't get up. Some people don't can't afford Sky, can't afford the. How many how many is there actually? I forget now. I've got all of them. We've got Sky, BT, Amazon, etc. And they're all subscription paid, aren't they? So yeah, yeah, yeah. I think. But this is what this book talks about. Now. It's just that extreme where it's gone on the focus of money, uh, and the words are product, etc. Uh, and uh, but you can't fault the players as you yeah you've touched on really. Someone's going to give you. I know someone wants to give me two hundred grand a week. I'd say yes. So uh, yeah. Were you taking a pay cut? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've had to. I've had to take a cut. Yeah. You look Just at go back a little bit. The, yeah, you look at some of the players now <laughs> at the top level in the game, and you, you you're looking absolutely ridiculous. I mean. You're almost looking yeah. at for some of them a million pounds a week. I mean, it, I it just has gone to the extreme. And as yeah. it would be nice if we could just push back a little bit and um, make sure that the supporters are looked after. But again, supporters, unfortunately, seem to be a byproduct <laughs> of football rather than the most yeah. important people in football these days. On the last podcast, you did mention about a book, uh, Jack and Bobby, um, coming out. And I did say, I'm almost certain that I've got one in my library. And I've dug it out. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Leo, Leo McKinstry. I'm not too sure if you're aware of that writer. I didn't realise it, but I got two of his books. You know what I'm like with books. I buy these yeah. books, and I rarely read them, but I do have them because I just love football books. I'm like <laughs> a kid in a sweet shop with football books. And it's, um, I, um, it's called Jack and yeah. Bobby, A Story of Brothers in Conflict. That weird is that you mentioned that, because I, when we were talking last week, you mentioned it. Mm. And I thought, oh, I've got to dig that one out then, if that rings a bell. And I did look into it, yeah, and there is, yeah. I've, I've not read it myself. Yeah, it came back, I think mean, it was, came out a number of years ago, didn't yeah, it? it is, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, I did find it actually after we spoke. So, uh, yeah, uh, Leo, Mc, Leo, Leo McKinstry. McKinstry, that's it. yeah. Uh, first yeah. published in paperback in 2003. First published ah, in yeah. hardback um, by Collins Willow, an imprint of. Harper Collins Publishers in London in 2002. So, yeah, 20 years ago it was first published. That's um, it's a biography of them, too. It's not an autobiography in any way, is it? I think it's a biography. No, I would imagine it's a biography, yeah. 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 Um, Leo McKinstry is a journalist and author. He writes regularly for the Daily Mail, Sunday Telegraph, and Spectator magazine on a wide range of subjects. He also published several books, including the claimed biography of Jeff Boycott, uh, born in right. Belfast in 1962. He's married and lives in Essex, so 62. He's only two years older than me. 
Excellent. Yeah. So, well, so that makes Charlton. him old. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Charlton brothers, uh, you, they have that unique place, don't they, in the history of football. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Jack and Bobby, don't they? So uh, what they went on to achieve and in different ways as well, didn't they? They took kind of different paths a little bit. And you think of what Jack went on to do. I don't know if you saw that documentary was it last year, the year before. Um, oh, it was a brilliant documentary. Finding and Jack. I can't think. That's it, Finding, Finding Jack. Jack. Yeah, yeah. Right. wonderful. I can remember now. I don't mind telling everyone I was in. I felt I was in tears. Mm. Parts of that, um, you know, just thinking in dementia. My dad um, suffered with dementia, etc., and all that, and just watching someone change, you know, etc. Mm. But what a life they led! You know, incredible, isn't it? And obviously, Bobby's going through that now, isn't he? Sadly. Yeah, I mean, I don't right, so. know anything about Bobby, but no. I know quite a lot about Jack. Through, yeah, through yeah. Terry Curran, Terry played for Jack at Sheffield Wednesday. Yeah, of and course. some of the stories that he tells about Jack. I mean, <laughs> Jack, he didn't like Jack's philosophy in the game, but Jack's an absolute top bloke. I mean, he'd yeah. he'd, he'd, he'd row with with the best of them, Jack. And yeah. uh, in fact, I'm doing I'm doing a, a podcast, a seventies legends pop, uh, podcast, with the great Johnny Giles. Um, oh, yeah, Excellent. and Steve Perryman as well over the next couple of three months. So I've been researching a little bit about Johnny, and there was a tremendous um, interview in Back Pass magazine of uh, yeah. Johnny Giles in two parts, and he was talking there about Jack, and uh, they used to row a little bit him and uh, him and Jack, and, <laughs> and 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 Jack was setting his ways, shall we say, and liked yeah. to do things his way, and uh, Johnny yeah. said. Oh, you know, Bobby wouldn't get in your bleeding team, and Jack said he would do if he did, he did as he's told. <laughs> I <laughs> think that's always been Jack, but he would row and argue with TC. It almost come to blows, but he'd always <laughs> go and uh, come on, TC, let's go and have a game of snooker, or we're going to have well, a game. So that was yeah. always Jack. He would never uh, a man's man, as we would say yeah. in old money, and a top man as well. Yeah. So I can't really speak about Bobby because I don't know anybody that that played for or, or knows Bobby Charlton very well but Jack what an absolute legend diamond and a man yeah. that uh, he sorely missed by the game by his family Definitely. and by yeah. everybody in football yeah his autobiography is a really good read as well Jack's Jack Charlton's uh, a few, few years back I think it might have been re um Republished, I think it was, or yeah. updated fairly mm. recently. But uh, yeah, what a story! So uh, what a player at Leeds, of course, uh, the bulk of his career won. And you ask anyone from Ireland what they think of Jack Charlton? Absolutely loved, isn't he? Well, he wasn't at first, of course, when he, you know that kind of connection, the English and what have you. But my word, he didn't half win them over, didn't he? Over well, the, the years, yeah. The Irish uh, don't particularly like the English, and the mm. English don't particularly like the <laughs> Irish in some quarters. We was in Dublin a few years ago. And I was mm. sitting in an Irish bar because uh, mm. we was in Temple Bar, and there was oh, lots yeah. of that's cheap. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and there's lots of like O'Neills and kind of the Irish pubs that are English. And there was one spit and sawdust bar, and I said to the wife, "Come on, we'll go and have a pint of Guinness in a proper Irish bar." Anyhow, yeah. this Irish fella jumped on the table. Cut a long story short, he says, "Where are you from? What are you doing here? Get out of my no. pub." <laughs> And wow. yeah, so it was it was uh, pretty much like that. But you know, Jack, I'm sure had situations like that. But then, when you realise what a fantastic person uh, that, yeah. that, that you are yeah. in terms of Jack, the Irish public absolutely loved, adored, and cherished him. And he was uh, it was a match made in heaven, wasn't it? It was, it was. But linking that though, if you're talking about managers, yep. um, the one I recommended in the newsletter. It's a book called Living on the Volcano. Okay. Uh, this is called, it's, it's subtitled The Secret to Surviving as a Football Manager. Uh, it's written by uh, Malcolm, uh, Michael Calvin, who for me is, is, is right up there in terms of football writing. You know, he's absolute at the very top. In fact, um, there was a guy called Johnny Brick that recently um, did a football, uh, did a review uh, of his most recent book recently, and he shared it with me, and I shared it on our website. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he said about uh, Michael Calvin, the writer of his book, that he's a national treasure, and I'll say that as well. But this is a yeah, living on the volcano, and it's about football management, uh, and it's a brilliant, brilliant read. Uh, and it talks about the the um, the tribulations of being a football manager. Really, there's some brilliant stories in there. It goes goes from um, the the actual uh, forwards by Arsene Wenger, 
Okay. Um, but it covers managers the likes of Brendan Rodgers, who comes across really well in the book, actually. Brendan Rodgers as well, actually. Uh, in fact, there's, there's a little bit here that I picked out and where Brendan Rodgers was talking about um, when he, um, I think he got sacked, I think it was at Reading, um, but he talks about it here. I'm reading this out. This is his words, uh, Brendan Rodgers. I was sacked in the December. Mum died. She died quickly on the February the 3rd, uh, and not me for six. And for three months, um, I was the peer of the family. Uh, oldest of five boys. I could see my brother suffering. Uh, got up again and uh, represented him. And he got a job then at Swansea. And then his father passed away. Uh, he was young as well. So you think that Brandon Rogers, um, he's had tough times, you know, and that was during you know his managerial career. But what a, you know, he's had great success obviously at Liverpool and is at Celtic what was it just as well I never knew he was a Celtic fan as well as a Sheffield Wednesday fan uh, which I didn't know about so uh, Brendan was a Sheffield um, Wednesday fan yeah he was a Sheffield Wednesday fan for, right. for some time yeah so uh, uh, he, yeah because he was from obviously to Northern Ireland wasn't he yeah yeah uh, and uh, yeah so he followed Celtic but he also had a soft spot for Sheffield Wednesday of all teams but he talks about the Brendan I don't know, yeah, I don't know where I come from, so uh, I'm sure I read that. It's not in this book, sorry, by the way, about Shepard Wednesday. I've read it somewhere, and I'm, I'm sure I'm right. So it sticks in my head. I think I heard him say on, maybe on Talk Sport, but it was definitely Shepard Wednesday. Uh, it's something you, yeah, can suck as your reaction. I thought, oh, Lord, where's, where's that come from? <laughs> so, um, but no, he, 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 that's just one of the examples in this book. So he talks about the, the highs and lows of football management, and it's not just the likes of Brendan Rodgers. This also covers... You know, your managers down at the lower leagues, etc. It's a great one in here with um, uh, Ian Holloway as well. So uh, yeah. he's, as you know, he's quite a character, isn't he? Mm. Uh, and again, it talks about him when he got, I think, he was sacked at uh, Millwall. Uh, in fact, there's another line here, brilliant interviews in here. And he says, uh, this is Ian Holloway, he says, I'm a very emotional person. I have been all my life. Uh, I'm much like my mum. Uh, she'll cry a kitten not having a drink. It's unbelievable. You just you got great lines, uh, Holloway. But it's, again, it's just um, the life and times of football uh, managers, and uh, there's a lot being talked about mental health, etc. At the moment, and you really, when you read things like this, you think, gosh, you know, they, they obviously enjoy the game, don't they? But it is literally a twenty-four-seven job when you take on the football manager and you take all the abuse, don't you? You get the massive highs and you you're lauded, aren't you? And your team's doing well, but when they're doing wrong. You can't leave that car park, can you? So, uh, and there's things like that in here. But really brilliant read. Living on, living on the volcano. It's been out for a number of years now. But uh, yeah, highly recommend um, that one. From Michael Calvin, who's done a number of good books over the years. Beans is worrying the ballpark of the managers. Um, mm. Got a couple of, well, three books here. Of the England managers of, of my time in the 70s. Yeah. Which is the era that I'm still... If I was Doctor Who and I'd go in the TARDIS, I'd go back to the 70s and stay in the 70s. Don't blame uh, you. Because you know, yeah. I think <laughs> football was at its best in the 70s. Um, yeah. Sir Alf Ramsey, an outstanding biography by, again, Leo McKinstry. Oh, right, yeah, okay. I didn't know That's that. Cool. Oh, boy, I ain't read it. <laughs> but I bought this. <laughs> I mean, God, it's a thick book. It must have about 600... Well, 500... Just over 500 pages. So, oh, yeah. Wow. And then uh, Don Reeve, the biography by Christopher Evans, published yeah. by Bloomsbury. Again, yeah. I haven't read it, but I've got it, because uh, I like to buy these things for research as well, so when I'm doing podcasts, yeah. etc., I can dip into certain chapters. And well, that only tri- came out very recently, didn't it, Don yeah. Reeve's book? So, <laughs> yeah. Did, yeah. And of the trilogy of the England managers of the 70s, uh, Ron Greenwood, by Mike Myers, yeah. the biography of football's forgotten manager and I remember Uddy telling me about Ron Greenwood he phoned him up while he was in boots not the chemist but the uh, Duke of Wellington <laughs> pub in London on a right. Sunday night <laughs> and says uh, can you play against Brazil Wednesday and uh, Uddy wow. says well, I've been pissed for three days you've got no chance Ron <laughs> <laughs> and he won in the best of form at Arsenal so he declined it but you know the fact of an England manager phoning up yeah. the player can you play against Brazil Wednesday night on a Sunday evening is uh, reckon, quite extraordinary yeah. isn't it so yeah a lovely trilogy of of English managers of the 70s I have to say I didn't write any of them 
but they were the England managers, so I do cool. like to buy these books to have a read. Yeah, Ron about. Greenwood, he, he took over, obviously, in the late 70s, wasn't he? 77, 77 off the top yeah, there, and took them to the nine, nine, that's it, and took them to the 1982 World Cup, where we didn't lose a game uh, in no. London, did we? So, no, um, there, but, yeah. um, but no, he was obviously famed for, he was successful at West Ham, wasn't he? Uh, in his club days, yeah. so club management days, I mean, but... Um, I never read quite the highs, did he? Um, I think they wanted I've... a safe pair of hands. We often yeah. hear that phrase banded yeah. around in football. I think after Even Don Reavy, yeah, I think <laughs> after Don Reavy had left, and um, yeah. as it was printed, um, walked out on England and took the Arabs' money. But uh, yeah. that was a little bit harsh. I mean, I'm no great Reavy fan as England manager. I think as Leeds United manager, I think Don oh, Reavy. Yeah assembled the greatest football team that I've ever seen, British football team, yeah. in my lifetime. Um, but as an England manager, yeah. I don't know where it really went wrong. And I think what he tried to do is, because Leeds were a family, I think he tried to get England as a family. So where they yeah. play carpet bowls and bingo with Leeds United and do the karaoke singing and that, Alan yeah. Austin, Charlie George, Frank Worthington, Stamp Bowles, Alan Ball, all that kind of maverick players, Tony Curry, wasn't going to have any of that. They wanted to do their own thing. So I think that he, he didn't set off on the right track. He did keep changing the team. I think he had that many players. I don't think he mm. knew really what team to pick or what system to pick. And at the end of the day, he yeah. almost ate himself. I think some managers may be, first of all, it maybe just suits club management, yeah. like Don Revy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and like you said, the the, the players, it was like a family, wasn't it? Yeah, so, it was but he'd seen them on a, he'd seen them on a day to day basis. He's not going to international. And Brian Clough, obviously, when he went there for the, the infamous forty four days, he said that there was a, there was it was everywhere, wasn't it? Don Revy, he could feel it when you walked in. It was still his team, yeah. etc. And he couldn't, he couldn't uh, replace him. Well. Uh, yeah, as he famous in that interview afterwards when uh, Brian Clough got sacked and they're both in the studio, weren't they? Well, Clough's um, biggest problem was that mm. Leeds United in those days uh, arrived back mm. for pre-season training a week before everybody else and Cloughy was still mm. on holiday. Um, yeah. I think there was a couple of days went by before he never actually spoke to the players. <laughs> and then he famously had that meeting with them when they, I think Billy had, had called a, a, a meeting to introduce yeah, each other. And yeah, and he went round to a man, and you're a dirty bastard, and you're a dirty bastard. You're, and then you see that bin, get all your medals and stick it in that bin over yeah. there because you've cheated your way. And that certainly didn't endear him to the Leeds players. I no. said to Alan Clark, cause I'd done a lovely podcast with Alan a couple of years ago, and I asked him about that. And I, and I said, mm. if I was Brian, I would have said, look, OK, Ali Barley, what's been said has been said. Let's draw a line under it. You are mm. the greatest team that I've ever seen. And I haven't liked some of the things that I've seen you do, but, you know, that was under the the last gaffer. Things are going yeah. to change a little bit now, but you are the greatest team in England and you are the league champions. Alan Clark said he did say that, but it was too late and the damage <laughs> had been done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, no, and, and Clark, he said, right manager, but the wrong time. And that yeah, team that's... was all getting old together and it yeah. did need replacing. And I think that had they have been in their mid-twenties rather than late-twenties or early-twenties, I don't think Don would have left. I think he'd have probably stayed there because he was still yeah. building and he wanted a pop at the European Cup, which they actually, Leeds United, were cheated out of in 1975. They're also mm. cheated out of the Cup Winners' Cup in 1973. So when we when people do bandish around this dirty Leeds tag, and Johnny yeah. Giles was the silent assassin and he was dirty... Johnny Giles yeah. had uh, two really bad injuries from uh, Johnny Watts of Birmingham City and Eddie McCready of Chelsea. And football actually made Johnny Giles mm. the player that he was. Johnny didn't make himself that way. So, you know, there was yeah. a lot of, you know, Leeds, Leeds again, are a product of the times that Leeds played in. So yeah. I don't yeah. think, although history will always say dirty Leeds. And yes, of course, they, they were a little bit... And they were a little bit wild. But, they were in the second division rather than the first division. And I didn't realise when they come up um, in 1964-65 season, which was their first mm. season back, they come mm. second in the league and lost the FA Cup final to Liverpool after extra time. 
And Don yeah. Reavy did say, and, and would still stand by uh, that statement if he was alive today, that his greatest signing was uh, Bobby Collins. And there's a lovely book of Bobby Collins I've just purchased, The Wee Barra, uh, by David, oh, Sha- David Safer, who also wrote Sniffer's book, The Life and Times of Alan Clark, with Alan. He's wrote Excellent. a lot of the biographies, autobiographies, of uh, the yeah, great the Leeds good. players of the 70s. So, yeah, I'd never heard of David, but um, I have now. No, I yeah, he's books. done a few Leeds books. Yeah, yeah he's done the Revy's Unsung yeah. Heroes. Yeah, I remember one of them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. A, yeah book, very a, good. a book on Leeds he hasn't wrote, I just want to briefly mention this, um, mm. a story of sock tags and self-belief. Paul the Beaver oh, yes. Trevelyan, as told by Neil Jeffries, forward by Sniffer. And it tells the story of Leeds United in 1972, which is lovely because it is the 150th year of the FA Cup. And they won the FA Cup in 1972. And the sock tags, etc., come out in March uh, 1972 against Tottenham, which just coincidentally is Paul Trevelyan's team, not Leeds United. And I didn't realise what an absolute pioneer Paul Trevelyan yeah. is until I did a podcast with Alan Clark and Sniffer was telling me all about his great mate, Paul Trevelyan. Excellent. Now, I heard you talking about it on your recent um, yeah, podcast with Terry, Terry yeah. Curran, and uh, you talk, I, I must have looked into him a little bit. Yeah, because he's a Tottenham fan, isn't he? Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, very claimed um, artist, isn't he? Oh, uh, absolutely. Oh, he's yeah. drawn everybody. Incredible. Incredible, yeah. It's one of those I've, I've seen his drawings uh, after after I heard you. I looked at it. Oh yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. You so, are the red as well. Yeah, that's Paul yeah. Trevelyan. You are the ref. Excellent. Yeah, that was about um, two years back, didn't it? It used it to be Shoot Magazine, didn't it? You are the ref. Yeah, that's you know, it. That's they, it. It's um, you know, I've I've known of Paul for years and years, and I've heard him on Talk Sport as well. Yeah. Um. Sean Caden, a, a Facebook uh, friend uh, of mine, has always mentioned and messaged and said, "You want to do an interview with um, with uh, with Paul Trevelyan? We'll, we'll sort it out for you, mate." And, and I am doing a podcast with Paul. We have been interacting, and he's just waiting for a couple of dates because with the book being launched, there's a number of. I know he's doing Steve Perryman's podcast because I was watching Steve's brilliant podcast <clears> done <throat> every uh, every fortnight. And Paul's yeah. going to be guest on there. And I know he's got some book signings at Leeds. So I said, when you're all sorted, mate, and you've done it all, I'll do a nice little Brilliant. podcast. We'll sit down over a glass of wine and we'll talk about the great Leeds United well, team. I'll team. give that a shout out as well, the Beaver, isn't it? So again, yeah. I heard you on the uh, I heard you on the podcast, and it wasn't a book I was aware of, I must admit. So it came out uh, just last month. So uh, yeah, yeah but suddenly you, have, you do have a full of the books that come out, and some of them I just missed. For yeah. whatever reason, but uh, no, it looks fascinating. So yeah, story of sock tags and self belief. I love that's that subtitle. Yeah, I mean, yeah. he just done so <laughs> many instrumental things. We lose, you know. It was his idea to put the names of the players on the tracksuit um, on the tracksuit. Uh, yeah, I know. It was his really? idea to do the, you know, the warm ups before the before the nineteen seventy two FA Cup final. Alan Clark was telling me all about that because I played Birmingham City. I said, oh, by the way, thanks for that, Alan. Smashing the hell out of my boys and ruining my uh, <laughs> my, my cousin's yeah. wedding actually on the fifteenth of April, nineteen seventy two. One of my earliest <laughs> football memories. Running out the church to see how Birmingham were getting on and three 0 <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, <laughs> excellent! No, uh, brilliant. Well, um, uh, what was I just thinking of then? Well, when then um, I think back to nineteen seventy two because obviously Don Revy's great days, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, so I've asked if the tracks and tops you were talking about, yeah. they're, they're iconic, aren't they? I can yeah. picture that now, kind of thing. I even think back to the the film uh, The Damned United. Don't talk Brian about that, all wrong. Days. It not well, I know, I know that about, is yeah. You ask Johnny know, Gold I'm, about that, because I'm, I'm actually not going to ask Johnny about great, that. It's a great great actor he is, um, Gene, but no, I mean, even Barbara Clough, I remember famously said uh, about that film, how much she disdained it, because, of yeah. course, yeah, it was a lot of... Uh, well, vast majority was made up, but uh, no, I was just thinking even in that film there, you could see Jolton with that tracksuit top on, didn't you? Yeah. But obviously that's all come about from Paul Trevelyan then. He came up with that. Absolutely. That idea. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Excellent. But how can you 
do a film, make a film, produce a oh, film, yes. have Don't the film yeah. come out of the TV set where it's got the Damned United and yeah. there's a book that, that, that was written. David and, and, yeah. yeah. And you look yeah. at it and you go, it's, it's a fictional film based on fact. Hey, how, we, how we, does we, that even start to work? It's either yeah, fiction absolutely. or it's fact. It can't be based yeah. on fact. And you go, well, how much? It's like a sausage, isn't it? You know, you yeah. go, well, how much meat's in a sausage? If you're going to buy sausages, buy pork sausage. Because if you buy pork sausage, <laughs> there's more meat in a pork sausage than just a sausage. <laughs> It's I like, think the main, yeah, the main, the main bit from that film. I remember mean, again, uh, Brian's um, late wife, isn't it, um, Barbara? She said about because it's quite a focus on drinking as well. He, he wasn't a big drinker then. Uh, he certainly was, obviously, no, his late yeah. life, Brian, but not then. You know, and the focus on that was just, yeah, yeah. Terry yeah. Curran played for mm. Brian after, obviously, the the Derby situation yeah, yeah. there. Of course, yeah. After yeah, sorry. Leeds United. Terry Curran, while he was with Brian, never seen Brian touch a drop. Yeah. Never. Yeah. And and yeah, and, it, and it was just embellished. It's absolute as John and Giles have put us really a brilliant interview um in, yeah. in Backpass magazine. Absolute bullshit. And, uh, yeah. and and I do think that the the problem I have with these things is some people watch it and think that it a documentary and they, yeah. they hang on yeah. oh well that's what yeah. Brian Clough was like that's what Giles and Bremner and, and all the Leeds team and, that, and, and John and Giles said we didn't get out of the baseball ground and walk we'd have had our heads kicked in if we'd have done that back in the <laughs> 70s I know it's amazing isn't it but yeah. some people will believe it won't they and they've never heard us talking or anything like that it is the problem yeah. but some people in the younger generations I think the Premier League invented football as well, don't they? So yeah, we do, uh, yeah. there you go. <laughs> Again, another problem I have: football was yeah. invented. The first football leagues in eighteen eighty eight, not nineteen ninety two. How many times I hear on Sky Sports to keep saying uh, he's the highest goal scorer yeah. now in Premier League history? It's yeah. like what? Yeah. The Premier League's history is thirty years. Yeah. Is, it, is it thirty years now? Yeah, thirty 92, years. Yeah, not, 30 uh, years. It's not a, a hell of a long time, really, in the grand scheme of things. Our football. Our wow, football's been going in the, well, it's the 150th year of the FA Cup. Absolutely, yeah. Let alone. So, so but yeah, no, I agree. But certainly the damn, it was me who brought that up, uh, actually, the damn United, wasn't it? So, uh, apologies. But, no, no uh, don't but apologize. the Beaver. I'm... No, <laughs> that Beaver, I will uh, give that a mention, though, the Beaver the book. So, uh, yeah, definitely. I noticed given... the forwards by Alan Clark as well, isn't it? Sniffer. Yeah, yeah, Sniffer. Yeah. And let's give a shout out to um, when hmm. Saturday comes. I I do like that magazine. I subscribe yeah. to the magazine, and I'm also a Patreon as well. I like to listen to the boys uh, talk football. I think it's yeah, it's different. They're very very clever, aren't they? Uh, there's was it Andy Lyons, Harry Pearson, and yeah, who's that other fella that wrote the Nige, not not Nige Castle who wrote the Hard Yards? I'm gonna yeah. get to the podcast here. It's Andy Lyons who's the editor. That's it, Daniel Gray. That's the fella that I was... Daniel Gray. He's Daniel Gray, yeah. hasn't he? And he's the author oh, he's and presenter. Brilliant. And Harry Pearson is the uh, the columnist. And it is a really, really intelligent podcast. It's one of them that you, you can have in the background and you listen to it. And my yeah. ears pricked up when they were talking about Aston Villa in 1890 were the mm. um, baseball British baseball champions of well the, the, the Britain oh wow <laughs> yeah I know so I, was, <laughs> I, mean, I didn't realise they played baseball at Villa Park and, no and it, I didn't no I, didn't. I, I knew they did the baseball ground hence the baseball ground baseball was played there before football and, and yeah. there's, a, there's a book about the baseball ground isn't that and we, we, we were yes. talking with um um Blimey, Steve Bloomer, who played for Derby yeah. County at both football and he played baseball for Derby as well. So, you know, when I listen to little things like that, and I thought, well, what an educational podcast. So, well done uh, when Saturday comes. And on the back, there's a brilliant, um, brilliant advert of Pitch Publishing. Superb. Yeah. All the books that Pitch is oh, yeah. bringing out. Oh, I mean, 
So. Well, Daniel Gray, just he's one of my all-time favourite authors. I think I've, I'm sure I've mentioned him on our yeah, podcast he before. He's got a trilogy of little books, and they're all about the modern delights of football. It's brilliant, absolutely. Um, yeah, I have mentioned it, actually. Uh, what I actually shared one of them recently called Saturday 3 p.m., and it's all these yeah. little, little, yeah. little stories yeah. about um, the things you just remember about football. And it's yeah, he's, he's a very talented guy. He's on Talk Sport every now and again. I'm sure I heard him on Johnny Owen's program, great program, uh, on the Sunday, yeah, which is another great one on a Sunday morning a few weeks back. I think it was just after the Middlesbrough had beaten Manchester United in the FA Cup. Okay, and uh, he was on his way to another game somewhere, uh, a non-league or a lower league game. On that day, but uh, no, he's no. Uh, uh, when Saturday comes, brilliant, really good, superb, really and that good is my here. that is my favourite uh, show on Talk Sport as well. By the way, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, Jonathan Owen and friends, with, um, Mark Webster. I think it's absolutely Webster. tremendous yeah. couple of hours of of football talk and uh, have guests on there. I just think it's everything that a football show should be on radio. Sadly, Definitely. most don't produce programmes of that high quality, and a lot of it is absolute turgid rubbish that I listen to. <laughs> Although I do like to listen to Jim White and Simon Jordan. I do like to listen to Simon. I think he always nails it. Um, he does, doesn't he? He yeah. very much does know his stuff. He definitely yeah. knows his stuff, Simon Jordan. And again, linking it back to books, his book's really good. Simon Jordan's book, yeah. uh, which came out some years back. Um, whose name completes oh that's it Be Careful What You Wish For that's right uh, was his book and that's a really really good read because obviously he's been there he's done it he yeah. knows what it's like to mm. own a club so he does a these talks how many times you hear them you know on well talk sports well if I'm honest yeah. some of them don't know anything about football they talk as if they know it all at least Simon Jordan yeah he's talking from somewhere he's done it he's been there he's done that a little bit yeah he's got his own opinions kind of thing but he at least debates it on on facts and also it's his opinion isn't it so uh, that's, that's, everyone's got an opinion it doesn't have to necessarily have to agree with it do you but um, there you go well, that's it's what opinion. football's all about it is a game of <laughs> yeah. opinions and he's not frightened to voice that opinion he'll agree with people he'll disagree yeah. the one thing I'll always say about Simon is that he's always fair he's honest it's his opinion I think so and, and yeah. he listens to other people and and he, he will change his opinion, which is a, a sign of somebody that's intelligent because you have opinions. And then if somebody yeah. can advance a, an informed uh, debate that, that's yeah. got a bit more meat to um, some discussion and you listen, then you go, do you know what? I never thought about it like that. I'm, I've changed my well, opinion slightly. That's got to be yeah. good and refreshing. Well, he could become a multi-millionaire at the age of 32. He must know something yeah, yeah, yeah. to... Uh, to... <laughs> Still got phone, to that kind of... He did, yeah, that's it, yeah. He made a fortune out of building a phone company, didn't he, from scratch? Yeah. yeah. Before, um, yeah, he sold Crystal Palace. Like, 75 was, million, I think it was. Was a pro footballer, wasn't he? Yeah, that's it, yes, correct. Mm. Yeah. No, it's a really great book, that one as well, uh, Simon Jordan's. And let's give it, while well, we're talking football magazines as well, World mm. Soccer and, uh, and 442. I do like to buy these magazines. I rarely read them all, but I do <laughs> like to buy them and have a look and see what's going on. But um, yeah, Pitch Publishing, some fantastic um, titles coming out um, this year in 2022. Uh, yeah. Life, the Life with Robins and Beyond, Jeff Merrick. That's uh, I believe there's a, a book signing as we're speaking now in the Bristol area, and that was um, uh, Neil Palmer. That, uh, that yeah. wrote that. There's a lovely book about Don Howe coming out uh, shortly. Another the cup, which looks like yeah. another commemorative FA Cup, 150 years. Eddie Hapgood, uh, footballer, the Busby, the last Busby babe, uh, Sammy McElroy, Fox yeah. and Luffs, which is one that you've spoken about. Goodies yes. and memories, yeah. Scottish League Cup. I didn't realise Archie Gemmell was the first substitute um, in Scotland in 1966. Oh, was it? Oh, yeah. Okay. 65, 66 cool. season, it was uh, Keith Peacock. But uh, but Archie made his... Uh, yeah, he come on a substitute, which he was the first. And that was in the Scottish League Cup. We have spoken on podcasts before. There's not one about the English League Cup, a book. And there's not there's one not. in Scotland, but not one of... 
I'd love one of England in the 70s because we played 100 games. I'd love somebody yeah. to write that book. I'm sure someone... Uh, well, they, I'm sure someone out there heard us last time, Gabby, and uh, we should have got some royalties, I think, from that if someone starts to write it as well. So, uh, <laughs> but no, someone should do because, uh, again, the Football League Cup was lots of uh, great stories, isn't there? From oh, there. absolutely. Um, yeah, but much like the FA Cup, really, in many ways. So, so a new biography yeah. on Peter Doherty, which is I've actually ordered um, his autobiography, 1947 it was written. I didn't realise how brilliant a football player he was until I start talking and looking at bits and mm. pieces and I get lots of information from, from YouTube, really. I watch people <laughs> talk, you know, not made-up stuff, but real stuff, or people that were there at the times or people that have wrote books about them. It saves me yeah. reading them. And, and of course, Bill Shankly, when he walked into the Stoke City dressing room in 1975, Easter Monday, 1975, and said to Alan Hudson, I didn't think I'd ever see a performance that surpassed that of Peter Doherty, but you've just done it, son. And that leads us nicely to the year we nearly won the league, Stoke City in the 1974-75 season by Jonathan Baker, forward by Terry uh, Terry Conroy, rather. And uh, nice picture there on the front of Wad the God and uh, Greenoff and uh, Alan Hudson. I've got an idea. That was the, um, might be the fourth goal against Man City. There, that would be celebrating. He's jumping all over. Yeah, jumping up. Yeah, yep. I've done a lovely podcast with Al Game in my life, which we talked about the season as a whole, as well as the Liverpool game on that Easter Monday when um, Tony Waddington got the pitch watered because he couldn't play, <laughs> and the yes, that's <laughs> five brigade coming watered the pitch. And that would he played the game of his life, hence the um, game of my life podcast with Alan Hudson. Excellent, excellent. Now, there's a lot, there's a, quite a few new releases. You've touched on a few there as well, then. So, uh, if you want to, to touch on a couple more, um, but um, they came out. Um, so, there's uh, Losing My Spurs. Uh, this is a memoirs of a failed uh, footballer um, whose name's got completely up on the head. Someone Potts. It'll come back to me in a minute. But he played alongside uh, Anthony Potts, that's it. He played alongside. Um, uh, Paul Gascoigne and Gary Lineker is part of the Tottenham side that won the 1990 FA Youth Cup. And um, so it's um, subtitled The Gather, The Grief and The Glory, Memoirs of a Failed Footballer. So some, type, some of these books, I've, I've, I've read a number of other books. Um, I've not read this one yet, but books like uh, The Boy, Boy on the Shed, I know we've mentioned that yeah. um, recently. There's, there's books where there's footballers that have not had that successful career. Uh, as they could have or would have liked to have and this is another one of them and some of them are yeah a really fascinating read so that's uh, one that's come out uh, Rise Together uh, Coventry City under Mark Robbins yep. um, so talks about when Mark Robbins returned there in 2017 I think it was uh, and uh, yeah he's doing a brilliant job now isn't he I think they're I think they're mid table. I think they're only about five points off playoff at the moment. Off, just dropping off, yeah, they? just dropping off slightly. It's still very close, though, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, and obviously they return back to the Rico Arena, which is a, which is a nice little ground. I've been there, so it's a new ground. Um, there's an interesting bit where you've got the casino attached to it. I don't know if you've ever been there. I've been but, to Highfield uh, got... Road, but not Rico. Yeah, that's, yeah, Highfield Road. That was. Um, Fabulous little ground, wasn't it? Oh, but, like, it reminded me of the baseball ground, yeah. actually, for some reason. But Derby. Um, but the Rico Arena, it's one of these, yeah, a lot of these arenas are very similar. The modern build, you know, it's got a casino attached on it. Um, but uh, anyway, so that's Rise uh, Together, Mark Robbins um, by Alan Sloman. That's also come out by Pitch Publishing. Uh, it's a few others have come out by Pitch Publishing. Uh, one that's titled, interestingly, um, Hope You Die. How do you die of cancer? Uh, life in football. So, yeah, um, yeah. non-league. Yeah, so, yeah, that's it. So it's focused. It's well, it's actually a footballer X. So it's one of these secret footballers. So it talks about oh. dust ups, bust ups, and etc. So, uh, um, but yeah, it's a bit like a, there was a book that came out a number of years ago. You probably heard of it uh, called The Secret Footballer. Yes. So it's a bit like that. So it's that kind of similar, but based on non-league football. So, yeah, that's an interesting. To see. Um, that one so it just come out last month. Um, there was a couple of others from Pitch Publishing. So uh, Europe's next powerhouse. This is based on Chelsea FC, the women's team. Um, 
and uh, how they well they're the, currently the super uh, I think the women's super league champions at the moment uh, they are and they're managed by Emma Hayes yep. I've seen her a few times on uh, BBC and IT she speaks really well I find Emma Hayes if you know who I'm referring to um, and I think she previously managed over in America before coming over to most Chelsea but it's so yeah but that's um, based on Chelsea FC women Europe's next powerhouse uh, a couple of others fit and proper people. Um, I recently shared uh, a book review of that particular one. Really interesting. It's based on the. Uh, it's a story of um, uh, there was a, a, a particular gentleman that brought out um, something called Own AFC, where basically it promised that you could buy into a football club. Basically, it was a, it was an app of some mm-hmm. sort, uh, and I don't really know fully. All about. I've not read the book myself, but it sounds fascinating. But yeah, ONFC, and it was it was actually boosted by the likes of BBC, etc. Because basically, you could invest. I think you could invest either forty nine pound or ninety nine pound to be associated to this club. Uh, but it was all it was all um, a spoof, pretty much, and absolutely incredible. Yeah, and these two these two guys that wrote this book, they're the ones that you know looked into it. Martin Callandine and James Cave. So Martin Callandine, he's wrote. Another book previously called The Ugly Game. Uh, I think it's The Ugly Game. Um, and uh, yeah, they on earth uh, what was happening and basically it was uh, taking money off people, etc. It sounds a fascinating story and just how they managed to get away with it, etc. So, uh, and people obviously bought into it and what have you. So, fit and proper people, uh, that is. So, and uh, yeah, there's a book review you can see on my football books on our website. Uh, Eddie Hapgood, I think you mentioned that actually, didn't yeah. you? So that was yeah, yeah one that's yeah. come out. Yeah, uh, and then wrote, uh, he? his sorry? daughter wrote his daughter wrote that book. Didn't yeah, he? So, yeah, yeah, Lind- yeah, yeah, that's it. And then Foss and Luffs, yeah, which I've mentioned before as well. So the the football rivalry um, from many years ago in Victorian times between Leicester uh, Foss, as they were known before they become Leicester City in uh, 1919, I think they become Leicester City. And that was, um, yeah, Loughborough FC, the Luffs, as they were called, which are no longer going. Well, sorry, they are, actually. They they still play, I think, in the Leicestershire... I did a bit of research. They play in the Leicestershire Senior League. Uh, they do at the moment. So, uh, but I love these kind of stories. It's history of the rivalry um, from back in all those years uh, in the early 19th century. Uh, or 20th century, sorry. Um and uh, a couple of us that came out recently was Rangers shirts. So this is a record of all the greatest collection of Rangers shirts for the years. There's a number of books like this that have come out recently. Uh, I think Arsenal done one recently, and Tottenham, etc. And I think, uh, I think Tot- Leeds have done one as well recently. It just shows how shirts have changed over the years. So there's, as you've ever seen on um, on Twitter, there's. I never realised how many people are so fanatical about football kits oh, and collectors yeah. Yeah. of football kits. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah, it's incredible business. Incredible business in terms of memorabilia and the money to make from that, really. So, uh, but, yeah, that's a few books that's, coming, uh, that's already come out in January. What was the last uh, football shirt book? you bought? You bought? <sighs> Goodness. I bought Gunter Netzer's, uh, well, Gunter didn't wear it, but Gunter Netzer's yeah. Borussia Mönchengladbach shirt of the 70s. I'm that was the last football shirt I bought. <laughs> I think I've got a, an England 1996, 1966 one. I think I might have bought one of the old ones. So it was yeah. um, long-sleeved uh, a few years back. I don't think it fits into it anymore at the moment, but there you go. <laughs> so it's a different story. But yeah. <laughs> I'm liking this The Neely Men. That's coming out shortly as well. Um, my eyes aren't as great as what they used to be, but <laughs> I don't think this print on on the uh, the back of uh, when Saturday comes is that clear, if I'm honest. So yeah. apologies for not um, being able to read who wrote it, but the Neely men, and there's a picture of Puskas on the front, looks like Cruyff. Um, I know you mean. Zico. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's by Aiden, Aiden Williams. Oh, yeah, okay. So, uh, yeah, I think it's connected to these football times, I think it is. Yeah, so, it uh, is. I'm sure it is. That's a name that's yeah. really familiar. And out of the blue as well. Um, yes. That uh, that book's coming out as well, or is already out. 
Yeah, it's, I think you know, it comes out. Uh, I think it comes out in either March or April. It was written okay. by Gary Packer. That's, uh, that's again, right, yeah. yeah. The Vince Football Times did beautiful Bridesmaids, uh, one of my favourite books from last year. Yeah. And yeah, that's about um, out of the blue when Villas Boros, remember him? <laughs> he was the dismissed by Chelsea in uh, March 20, 2012 when he was replaced by Di Ma- uh, Matteo, wasn't it? Um, Matteo? Yeah, Matteo won the, uh, he won the, uh, the uh, Champions League, yeah. didn't he, for him, yeah. He took it on to him, and uh, I think he got sacked, though, didn't he, in November of the same yeah, year. They, they don't <laughs> tend to last long at Chelsea, do they? <laughs> they he did last long at Villa, either, did he, for a month? He was only no. there for about 20, 12 games as well, actually. Well, in the so, Premier well, League, you don't last that long if you don't keep winning. <laughs> glorious, yeah. um, glorious reinvention. Story of, uh, of Ajax. That's one that's, um, yeah. that's took my fancy. And the Newcastle United book, The Great Days of... 1904 to 19... Again, it's not the biggest... 1911. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 1904 to 1911 by David Potter. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, obviously it's a football mad city, isn't it? So, uh, but in the Magpies glory days of well over 100 years ago, they were considered at that time the best team in the world. So, yeah, yeah, they won the the English League three times Mm. in five years. Yeah. I think they won the English Cup... um, and several near misses as well. Mm. And many of the players played for England and Scotland around that time. So, yeah, it looks a fascinating book. I think there um, might be a book coming out. Aston Villa, the world's first uh, world champions as well, because they they were vote, they were talked about as the greatest uh, club side in the world, wasn't they? Round about yeah. those days when uh, I think George Ramsey was the manager. They won six league mm. titles and I think six FA Cups as well. <laughs> Yeah, during Ramsey's time, so they were and Newcastle, of course. Yeah, absolutely. They those were the halcyon days of Newcastle. Hopefully, they'll be able to revisit those halcyon days with the uh, the billions that the Saudis are going to throw at the again the project. Yeah. Three goalkeepers and uh, seven goals as well. Yeah, Leicester City. Yeah. What's that about? Yeah, no, no, I shared that recently on uh, yeah. on the Twitter page and. Uh, and it's fair to say it got a lot of traction from Leicester fans. So it's obviously a very well known game for Leicester City. But yeah, it's three goal three, um get my words out. Yeah. Three, three goalkeepers. goalkeepers and seven goals. And yeah. it's about a particular game, uh, one of the most memorable matches in Leicester City history. It was a quarter final FA Cup final against Shrewsbury Town. Really? And being sad as I do, I actually looked at it on YouTube. And it was quite a game, to say the least. Oh, right. So basically, uh, yeah, you got to the one of the keepers, the Leicester keeper, got injured. Then he was replaced. I'm trying to remember the. I might get this wrong, but I think he was replaced by because he only had one sub. Oh, did he have any subs at that time? I'm trying to remember, but the the attacker went in goals, and then I think he got injured. So he had to change another keeper. Uh, but yeah, it was a fascinating game. Gary Lineker scored as well in that game. So. Uh, so yeah, Gary Leicester Lineker City. Going goal. I vaguely remember Gary Lineker going in goal for Leicester That's, in some game. Yeah, but not this. Don't, I don't think it was this particular no. game. I don't remember when I saw it on the clip. So, yeah. um, but no, yeah, it's about that about that game. So uh, the fact that you can write a book about one particular match just shows anything, doesn't it? So, uh, but when I shared it yeah, on a Twitter page, everyone's like, "Oh, I remember that game. I went to that game, etc." It did look fascinating. It was, it was a big crowd as well at Filbert Street. Um, yeah, so it finished Leicester five, Shrewsbury two. I think Shrewsbury, I think it was two, two and a half time, or I think Shrewsbury might have gone two one up as well. So, uh, but no, yeah, Leicester City's greatest ever match. That is so. Uh, check it out on YouTube. If, um, yeah, will do. If you're a Leicester fan. I'll get yeah. that book. Right. That, that looks interesting. I, I like to get books that are interesting because when I buy something, it's always like leading to something else or to inspire me. And uh, I was watching uh, Leatherhead versus Leicester uh, oh, yeah. t- today, 3-2 from 19 <laughs> January 1975, the Leatherhead yeah. lit, because we were talking about that on the podcast, uh, we don't rehearse anything on the podcast or any of my podcasts, <laughs> we just start talking and going off on one, and TC and myself were uh, talking about the FA Cup, and Leatherhead and Leicester. I thought that game was played at Filbert Street, but it wasn't. It it was at Le- uh, Leatherhead, and um, right. Leicester ran out three two winners. But I remember that from years and years ago when it was on Match of the Day. 
because they played yeah. leather green kit, didn't they? Leatherhead, and I'd never heard of Leatherhead before as a I was no. ten at the time, and I thought, well, that's a nice name, isn't it, Leatherhead? <laughs> and, yeah, uh, you'd be able to find that on YouTube as well. I'm yeah, sure well, you'll find that. It, I was watching it. Oh, did you say it was on there? All oh, right, yeah, I'll have to today. check that out then. Yeah, excellent. And, and that's the one in the end, didn't they? Sorry? Leicester did win in the end. Yeah, the one Leicester three did win in the end, didn't they? Yeah, yeah three two. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, rings a bell. 1975. Some iconic, yeah. iconic. We were talking about iconic um, FA Cup goals, etc. And we were talking about the Ray oh. Radford. So I've done a podcast with Pat Howard, who was on the pitch, as well as the ball was whistling over his head, and he looked and thought, "Wow, well, half a chance of going in that has." And then Ronnie Radford's goal in the top, top corner of the net, still rising as he hit the back of the net. And Love that on, goal. Yeah, went on to knock yeah. out. Uh, and Newcastle United that day, but uh, yeah, love that goal. Yeah, you can just it's a lot of hairs on the back of your neck. You just even think of that goal, really. The oh, way he whacked it. Oh, what a what a hit! What a hit! And, and also, it's the pitch, the atmosphere, oh, and everything, isn't it? About yeah. particular. Yeah, and I think what was great, I thought, was well, the FA Cup just a few weeks ago. I think mean, again, I mean, it's been a bit of talk over a few years, isn't it? The FA Cup is not as important as it used to be. I don't know. I've, I've seen that. I think more and more clubs seem to be putting out those stronger teams again in yeah. the FA Cup. So, I said uh, that on a podcast. I don't know whether it's because you? it's the yeah. 150th year. Yeah. And yeah, they've been may well told be. to, because centenary, 150. Yeah. Put a strong yeah. team out. I, d- I don't know. I don't know whether there's been anything from the FA that have said you must put a strong team out because it's 150 years. I don't know. But I have just, noticed that they've put strong teams out. But it's been some brilliant games, hasn't it? Really yeah. brilliant. You know, well, I live not far from Kidderminster, and I can tell you, in that yeah. week building up to that, uh, that game when they had against West Ham, like, you could feel it in the area. You really yeah. could. And the local press and the local news and the papers. Just walk, it was a real buzz around this area. Yeah. You know, I'm not a Kidderminster fan by any means. I've been to the ground uh, a couple of times. But the buzz in the area was amazing. I'm watching that game. I, I, I was a kid of Minister fan. I think there's quite a few people out there, you know, as underdogs, nothing against West Ham at all. But, oh, and it was so cruel at the end, wasn't it? Oh, uh, at the end of 90 know. minutes, and then at the end of 120 yeah. minutes. But just just brilliant. And then you, then you saw Bourne Wood. At least they um, managed to do it against Bournemouth, didn't they? So, uh, but just great moments in the FA Cup, isn't it? Really, really good. I could talk for England about FA Cup, you could probably tell. So I'm uh, just such a good, great fan of it. And it's great there's a few books coming out to celebrate it as well, like you said, over the coming months. Absolutely. But, uh, I've done a lovely podcast with, with Pat out another one, um, mm. Game of His Life, about the 1974 FA Cup final. Um, yeah. And also in 1974, the uh, a, a one-off podcast about the infamous FA Cup Quarter final tie between Newcastle United and Nottingham Forest, and to this day, oh, Forest fans are yeah. still fuming about that, aren't they? <laughs> They're very much shy. Uh, I do remember that. Yes, it's um, at Newcastle, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, it yeah. was, it was it, literally the game was abandoned, it was a void game. Um, yeah. Newcastle, um drawn out the act to, to uh, Nottingham Forest. So it was at St. James's Park. There was a full crowd, probably about 60,000. Forest took a yeah. large contingent there as well as they would. Great football club. Forest took yeah. an early two-goal lead. Newcastle pulled one back. Duncan McKenzie then ran into a, a defender and got a penalty. Duncan was yeah. doing that. And Pat said it was never a penalty ref. And the referee says... It's yeah. a penalty, get out my face yeah. kind of thing, or I'll send you off. And he said, well, you send me off, you'll cause a riot. And yeah. he says, if you don't shut up, I'm going to send you off. And, uh, yeah. and he did, he sent Pat off. Sure enough, um, moments after, the Newcastle fans come on the pitch, there was oh, a pitch yeah. invasion, players yeah. got took off, come back on, Bobby Munker scored the winner, late on yeah. in the game, for his steward inquiry, and the, uh, the FA turned it over, abandoned the game. And played two replays at Goodison Park. Yeah, McDonald scored. I think he got the winning goal, didn't he? He did. Yeah, the first remember. game was nil nil, and then Super Max scored um, one nil yeah. in the uh, in that second replay. Yeah, as Malcolm did yeah. in every every round, not every game, but every round of that cup that year, uh, Malcolm scored apart from the final. 
Yeah, you'll be definitely able to find that on YouTube if you wanted to. So yeah, Forest fans will definitely <laughs> certainly remember that one. Yeah, oh, from seventy four. Sorry, they still ain't happy, are they, about that? But no. They, um, what we no. mentioned early in the podcast, football <laughs> fans, they are a different breed, and they do <laughs> hold on to things for generations, don't they? Yeah, absolutely. And it did change the t- that game when they, uh, yeah, when I was obviously they coming to the picture. It was uh, feverous, feverous ground, let's say, wasn't oh. it? Oh, <laughs> At that time, to say the least. So, yeah, it certainly swung it. But, yeah, great memories of the FA Cup, though, one way or another, isn't it? So, uh, again, it just shows how uh, that was a quarter-final tie and just shows how important it is for, for many people. We've got that coming up soon, haven't we? The quarter, oh, no, the fifth round is coming up next, isn't it's it? It's so midweek quite... again, isn't it? Fifth round of quarter-finals <laughs> midweek. Why would you do that? 150th oh, no. year, you might be telling teams to get a strong team, make sure that the FA Cup doesn't lose the magic. Then you put the bloody fifth round and sixth round in midweek. Oh, yeah, right. I know. Come on, I know. But, and uh, we need to change that semi-finals as well. I think I heard you did say on your post and I was nodding yeah. away in agreement when you said it about them playing at Wembley. Yeah, but the Wembley are oh, just why do you? Why yeah. that was just some great memories of FA Cup finals yeah. at um, you know Villa Park. Yeah, yeah Villa, Park. Villa Park stands out. It was High brilliant Bray. arena. Hillsborough, yeah. Villa Park and yeah. Hillsborough, of course, are the two. But Ibury yeah. played quite a few games at Ibury, and then you know probably Old Trafford, Park might have an Old Trafford. Well, Old Trafford yeah. famously hosted the how the um, the replay of Chelsea versus uh, Manchester, uh, sorry, um, Leeds United in the nineteen seventy. Yeah. The yeah. football world wanted Chelsea to play Manchester United because Leeds knocked them out in the semi final, <laughs> but Alan Hudson wanted. Leeds United because he always liked to go up against Bremner and Giles. Yeah, always got yeah. the best out of Alan. But another load of books that I want to mention because it is February. We were going to do the podcast a, a week or so ago, which would have been earlier in February. And um, on the sixth of February, nineteen fifty-eight, we lost arguably the greatest British team ever, the Babes. Mm. And there's some yeah. lovely books that I've got. Um, David Hall, Manchester's Finest, How the Munich Air Disaster Broke the Heart of a Great City. The Busby yeah. Babes, Men of Magic by Max Arthur. The Lost Babes, Manchester United and the Forgotten Victims of Munich by Jeff yeah. Connor. And then yeah. two books on uh, on Duncan. One by Jim uh, James Layton, Duncan Edwards, Just Simply the Greatest. And mm. by uh, Ian McCartney, uh, forward by Harry Gregg, uh, Duncan Edwards, yeah. the full report. So a, a number of Manchester United books that I have in my collection. Yeah, no, they all do great justice as well to the book. The one that I shared uh, on that day, on the anniversary of the sick, um, on the day uh, recently, was The Lost Babes yeah, by Jeff Connor. Yeah. Um, so it's just just such a sad story, isn't it? Um, it's just remarkable in terms of yeah, really uh, catapulted. It's obviously catapulted Manchester United, in, you know, in terms of its, you know fame, etc., and what have you. Um, but in terms of the um, the players who were lost, obviously not just the players. You forget there's the other people on that plane, weren't they? The yeah, journalists and etc. that were lost as well. That tragic accident, and was it the third attempt as well when they were trying to take yeah. off and things like that? It's just incredible yeah. when you think back to it now. What, what would you know? How would that ever would never happen? Would it nowadays? There really? Book so uh, there's a, the, the um, yeah, there's another book. I'm going to go downstairs. You might have heard a bit of a row because the television's on. <laughs> but there was a. I'm sure there was a journalist on the plane uh, that wrote a book on the Busby Babes. I'm just going to open my... Not like you said, I'm sure in your house you have a book, you know, all your books. You sit yep. anywhere, you're not having one. I want a bookcase to get all my books, <laughs> but my wife won't allow me to. And I can't find it, but there is another Bus, um, Busby it Babes does. book, but I can't put my finger on oh, yeah, it. There you go, it got might... it, got it. It's written by That's Frank it. Taylor. The day a team died, 
And it's the, right. about the Munich air disaster. Classic eyewitness account of Munich 1958. So I thought I had another Busby Babes book in my uh, my collection. Yeah. And yes, it was down there. But all my books are hidden away in my little cabinet that looks like a drinks cabinet. But it's got some of my yeah. favourite books. So, <laughs> so there's a number of books on the Babes. And there's a lovely book. I'm going to do another uh, Too Good to Be Forgotten with... Um, Roy Cavanna, my friend Roy Cavanna, MBE. Yeah. So he's written a book on um, uh, Coleman, Eddie Coleman. Oh, okay. Yeah, who was the youngest Busby babe to uh, to lose his life in Munich, age yeah. just 21. I think the average age was 22 of the babes. Eight of them, sadly, passed away. And yeah. many years before, in 1949, on the 4th of May, 1949, we had the Supergar air disaster where all yeah. the Torino team lost their lives yeah. as well. So we have but had then, a few yeah. air disasters. And we did with that Brazilian team, didn't we? Uh, we did, yeah, the Japanese ago. team. Yeah. yeah, from Triumph to Tragedy. Yeah, that's, um, again, the yeah, book came out about that terrible mm-hmm. tragedy um, fairly recently. And again, yeah, horrible accidents. Uh, of a great team, the whole team. Oh, no, sorry, it wasn't the whole team. There was, I think, there was three survivors uh, from the football team from that particular incident. But uh, and there has been some tragedies like that, hasn't there? Yeah. Uh, yeah and those. every single one of them has got an incredible story. They always seem to have some because the Japanese one is quite famous. Because of course, in terms of um, how the team were doing so well, very yeah. similar to you know the Bulldog Babes, etc. You know, there's no. It's just, yeah, the timing. It's never a good time, but it's, yeah, it's just the timing of these teams. It just seems, seems to makes it even more sad, doesn't it? Yeah, Another book of, uh, that we're going to move on from, the Busby Babes. Um, mm. A Busby Babe who was very instrumental in the birth of, or the rebirth, yeah. I should say, of football in America. Uh, soccer, as the Americans <laughs> over the other side of the pond call it. Uh, Dennis Violet, very, very instrumental in uh, in yeah. the rebranding, rebirth of uh, of soccer in America. And Ian Plender Leith, um, rock and roll yeah. soccer, the short life and fast times of American North American Soccer League, the NASL. And yeah. another book by Tom Scholes, Stateside Soccer, Definitive History of Soccer in the United States. Now, when I say rebirth, it was a rebirth because... They were playing football in America mm. in the 1920s because Bella Gutman was was out there playing. And I've mm. got an idea. It was the Wall Street crash that pretty much put paid to the, uh, the, the, the league, the professional league in America. In 1930, America finished third in the first World Cup in Uruguay. Yeah, and I didn't did, yeah. realise all that, that there was a history of America. So I'm going to look forward to reading that about the soccer history in the United States. And after the World Cup, the Americans really wanted to re-engage with association football, as they call it, soccer. And in 1967, yeah. it was the American Soccer League, the ASL, uh, and and there was a inf- very famous game between Washington Whips and Los Angeles Wolves, where Aberdeen were the Washington Whips, and Wolverhampton Wanderers were the Los Angeles Wolves, and Wolves beat really? the 5-4 in overtime, and to this day they still talk about that in 1967. The great Peter Knowles played in that, as did Derek Dugan and, and one or two others. Jimmy Smith played for um, the Washington Whips that day. Oh, wow. That's yeah. It was Aberdeen, yeah, Aberdeen versus Wolves in America. Yeah, no, there's, a, there's a recent book, and it's not going to... Uh, something, there's a gentleman called Bunk or Dunk, and there's a recent book that came out about US soccer history. I'll have to dig it out and share it with you. We'll mention our next podcast, so I'm sure you'll be interested in that. was talking about the, the life and times of the early days of um, American soccer, as you say, uh, and that came out fairly recently. I think it was last year it came out, mm-hmm. but for the life of me... I cannot think, and I'm hoping to get his name right. If I can find it out in the next few minutes, I will. Um, but, yeah, there was another book that came out recently. Um, yeah. I'm but, always... but again, you forget you forget yeah. how, um, you know, in terms of the early days, uh, sorry, th- how football did start a lot sooner than you think in America. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, a lot sooner. Um, 
Um, I, one of those, actually, there's a book, the, I know I'll talk about it pretty much on every podcast, but it's brilliant, by um, Chris Lee uh, of Outside Right, Origin Stories. Yes. And he talks about the band of pioneers and yep. talks about the early days of um, football in America in there as well. So, just, yeah. Yeah, it's got a longer, lot longer history than uh, some people may, may be surprised to hear. Oh, absolutely. Really? But the NASL is always, and it always has mm. been the league that fascinated me. And yeah. doing the podcast with Alan fascinates me even more because when Alan played for Seattle Sounders, played against some of the greatest players Love those that, names. That, oh, yeah, that were ever put on the <laughs> planet. And uh, Adrian Webster was a, cap- a captain of, of Seattle Sounders before Alan Hudson was captain. Um, 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 Adrian goes back to the times where they just started playing because Seattle Sounders were were born in 1974 and, yeah. uh, and, and we've done a lovely podcast talking about those early days when they played in the uh, Super Bowl of 77 against Pele in Portland yeah. and uh, well, that- and that book, The Rock and Roll Soccer, there's some great pictures in that book as well, actually. Uh, there's one picture I've got here in front of me. you got Pele and George Best yeah. uh, playing against each other. So, uh, you know, I'm a, <laughs> just incredible. Just, um, yeah, brilliant. Really good. And you've got uh, Rodney Marsh as well uh, in the Tampa Bay Rowdies. I love these names. But the t- teams are played for. Yeah, they were just the Tampa Bay. The sort of razzmatazz. Sorry? They were just the Tampa Bay, wasn't they, before Rodney put the Rowdies in them? <laughs> uh, well, this top is where he's got. Yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. I was just about to say because he's got his top. He's got the rowdies on the front of it. So, uh, yeah. yeah, there you're right. <laughs> and Philadelphia, we're just Philadelphia before Frank Worthington went over there, and they called him the Furies. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. And, and all the all the lads played out there. They were great times. And as I'm doing a Alan Hudson, we don't know whether we're going to call it Alan Hudson's NSL memories. Or uh, Hudson's American Dream. We, we're working on the title. I'm going to do it. Oh, yeah, the American Dream. That sounds good. Yeah, it does, don't it? To be good. fair. Yeah. Um, and Alan always said that he was born to play in America. He loved his time in America and would never have <laughs> come back. He uh, was it Colucci Brothers owned uh, yeah. Seattle, and then when they uh, the franchise got sold, as Udi said, yeah. you get a bad American, you get a bad American. And 1983, the Seattle, the franchise, pretty much <laughs> folded. You know, you were talking about YouTube, etc. And that, that I, rock and roll, this the book by Ian Blender. That's definitely one of those. I remember reading it. I do it quite often now. When I'm reading a book. It must have took me longer than uh, than it should do because I'm constantly on YouTube looking at some of the videos. No problem. As you're reading through it, you're like, yeah. oh yeah, I just want to Google that now. Just have a quick look. And you, yeah. by the time you know it, yeah, the book it should have took you probably a couple of days to read. It took you probably a month. Because <laughs> you've been dipping out in and out of YouTube videos, and you know what it's like. You see one video, and then you see, oh yeah, what about that one as well, etc. So, uh, but that's the beauty sometimes, isn't it? Of getting a mixture of seeing it both in the written form and also watching it again yeah, live. Yeah, this is not live. But, this is yeah. my problem when I read the book. If I do read the book, I'm doing it <laughs> to research because I'm doing a podcast, and as yeah. I'm reading the book, I have a piece of paper and I write down things if I'm doing an interview with somebody and then I'm looking, then I go on YouTube and I go, wow, I didn't realise that. And it's like Johnny Jules, for instance. I thought that Johnny's last game um, for uh, uh, Manchester United was the uh, FA Cup final in 1963 when they beat Leicester 3-1. That was the year that Dennis Law scored three times against uh, Gordon Banks and three different uh, teams, Scotland, yeah. Manchester United and the rest of the world. But he played in the Charity Shield against Everton when they got beat 4-0. And then for the mm. first game of the season, uh, he wasn't picked. And then uh, he didn't play again for Manchester United. And Don Revy took him to uh, Leeds United to play in the second division. Johnny said one of the big reasons that he did join Don Revy at Leeds United was Bobby Collins who uh, dropped down yeah. to the second division from Everton. So, you know, when you when I'm looking at yeah. things, I like yourself, go on YouTube, have a look, look at them yeah. talking, because there's so many little clips and stuff yeah. where you can listen yeah. to the players talk and uh, you get a great insight to it. So, yeah, that's the half the reason that it takes me so long to read a book <laughs> because I'm doing, I'm doing podcasts. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, it's a great source of information, isn't it? Definitely. Excellent. Um, a couple of other books uh, I didn't mention have also recently just come out. Um, one very recent, because you, you talked about Manchester United a little bit there as well, when you mentioned about the Bullsbury Babes, uh, is Rooney, uh, Teenage Kicks. Okay, There's a book yeah. that's just come out by Wayne Barton, who's yeah. a very prolific uh, writer mm. for Manchester United. And, um, yeah, so it's about... Rooney's career, uh, etc. And um, I always think about that goal he scored against Arsenal, didn't he? Went up for Everton, of course, when yeah. he was 16. And uh, I, I didn't realise, I forgot really, but Rooney scored a hat trick on his debut uh, for Manchester United. Oh, right. Uh, it was in a, yeah, he scored a hat trick on his debut. It was in the 6 2 win of a Fane Bache. So, um, yeah, I forgot when he scored yeah. a hat trick. Similar to. Um, I also um, saw a link to it. Alan Shearer, he scored a hat-trick on his uh, debut. That was for Southampton. So there's a few players out there who scored hat-tricks on their um, debuts. Uh, Ravinelli's another one, if you remember him. Yeah, he played at Middlesbrough. Feather. Yeah, yeah, the White Feather. He mm. scored a hat-trick on his debut for Middlesbrough against Liverpool in 96 at Riverside. But but going back to Rooney, yeah, so um, that's uh, Rooney's teenage kicks and... Uh, He's not doing too bad at his uh, management career either, isn't he? He's doing all right at Derby. If he, if he keeps them up, and uh, I watched the, um, uh, no offence to anyone who's listening from Peterborough Reading, but I watched them play last night, and uh, I wouldn't say uh, Derby should be too frightened, because I think them two, yeah, I think, I, think, I think they're just above them both, aren't they? But what he's doing there, Wayne Rooney, is incredible, really, because of a 21-point deduction, and the fact they're even... Uh, got a chance haven't they of staying up he's done an incredible well, job I said to Tom and I looked at hmm. um, the, the football league the uh, the championship league and I said yeah. do you know what if Reading would have been docked the same amount of points as Derby County mm. they'd be on mm. one point now yeah. so they would be on yeah. two because they just got the draw and when you look yeah. at Derby with the points deduction, then points added on, Derby are at least halfway up that championship. So that's what Derby, yeah. Derby aren't a bottom three team. They're halfway or just above or halfway in the championship. That's the yeah. level of Derby. I fully expect Derby County to stay up. And I think it will be one of the great achievements of, uh, of, of football, and not just modern football that was invented in 1982, uh, 1992 by Sky. Yeah. But since 1888, it would be uh, a fantastic achievement. And, yeah. and the fact that I think he only had about eight or nine plays, didn't he, in August. He had to beg and borrow and you know get well, a team together. It's absolutely just, I mean, it's a, it's a Hollywood blockbuster as well, isn't it? Yeah, and his team got his, they had to sell players, of course, in January again, didn't they? Of yeah, course, with uh, they don't it over him, yeah, so he yeah. lost um, yeah. the centre back, the Vince Stoke. Uh, yeah, yeah, his yeah. name is Jackie Oka. Jackie Oka, that's Jagielka, it. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. He's gone. Yeah, we um, have to get rid of a, a number of players. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah really they're still the, keeping going. <laughs> yeah, it really is a tale of against all odds, isn't it? So you can almost yeah. see Phil Collins doing the uh, the uh, yeah. the uh, um, you know the playlist the yeah. soundtrack to, uh, to this movie this great Hollywood blockbuster was uh, Wayne Rooney because he did play it over in America so they know Wayne over in America yeah. uh, he was at DC United wasn't he yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah uh, Get It yeah, On by it. John was it John Sperling uh, that looks as yes. though it's going to be a, a great book set against the backdrop of a three day week strikes political unrest freezing winters glam rock it tells an intriguing inside story about commercialism invasion yep. racism and hooliganism rocks the 70s game of association football that looks a cracking looks book I've got that one on order as well so I like yeah, anything likewise. 70s what are the 70s books that we got coming out on the horizon well, you've got um, uh, so get it, you've just mentioned yeah, get it on because you took the words out of my mouth. I was about to mention that mm. one. So, uh, um, Busby Babe, Sammy McElroy, um, yeah. is Wayne wrote that as well, didn't they? Yeah, that's with Wayne uh, with mm. Wayne Barton as well. So, obviously, um, yeah, he what, made well over four hundred appearances. Um, uh, not quite the seventies. You have got the Fields of Wonder. There's a book coming out which is about um, the incredible story of Northern Ireland's journey in the 1982 World Cup. Yes. Uh, by Eva Marshall. Um, I'm just trying to think of other ones of the 1970s. There's, There's a, a few book that's in coming 1958, out. 1958, isn't there? The Northern Ireland that got to the World Cup. The Spirit Peter, of 58. Yeah, yeah. Peter Doherty was the manager in those days. 
Yeah, yeah, that was it. So um, that was famous when they beat and they qualified to Italy, was it? Off the top of my head. I'm trying to remember where the World Cup was at that time. But 1958, yeah. it was in um, Sweden. Was it Sweden? That's, yeah. Of course it was. It was Sweden, yes. They yeah. all won it, didn't they? 5 2, the beats were yeah. in the final. Pelly yeah. nearly got yeah. knee capped. If you remember, yeah. a 17 year old kid who just sidestepped him and bang and knocked it in. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they were led by uh, Danny Plunchflower, weren't they? Uh, Northern Ireland team then, if yeah. I remember rightly. Yeah. So, um, but yes, yeah, so um, uh, there's also a few others that's coming out from May onwards. Um, and um, yeah, of course, in the 70s. But off the top of my head, I'm struggling to remember them off the top of my head. Ain't got a, yeah, barrel, so. ain't got a barrel of money, Sheffield United. Oh, by yes, Jason of course. Holyfield. Yeah. 75 yeah. United yeah. finished sixth in Division One. Yeah. Level with Stoke on 49 points. Stoke just had a better goal average. It was goal average in them days, not different. <clears throat> but within yeah. six years, they'd gone from the brink of greatness to relegation to the fourth division. And on the way, en route to uh, the fourth division, they played Sheffield Wednesday 1979 in mm. uh, what's known as the Boxing Day Massacre when yeah. Wednesday put United to the sword. And Terry Curran earned himself a few quid. Uh, he did all, by the... doing that doing that uh, <laughs> celebration, didn't he? Yeah, so uh... <laughs> in the left in his lane, and there he yeah. was. TC, he done some uh, sunbathing as well. On that. He, honestly, such a character, TC. He like yeah. he just like lay there on the floor on the ball, and, and like the United fans were going bar mate. They were they chucking. Were, were they it? were chucking. It was to be fair. He said it was mainly copper. But Sheffield United. Was I said, it? If that had been Chelsea, they'd have been at least fifty pences. <laughs> uh, Iceberg, you've got to watch it on YouTube if anyone's listening. Definitely watch yeah. that. Well, just watch that for the um, uh, for the crowd as well. The crowd was incredible, wasn't it? Forty nine thousand officially. Yeah. The bidder against wow. Bournemouth was forty eight thousand, <laughs> and that was forty. Yeah. That's the highest ever for a third, uh, third tier, third division in old money game of football. The red T C said there's no way there's forty nine, it's more like fifty nine thousand. <laughs> I mean the way yeah. they crammed them there in Hillsborough and that cop that cop at Hillsborough before it had the roof on was absolutely phenomenal. It looked as yeah. though it did go all the way up to the clouds. Yeah, and and I think did. most Sheffield Wednesday fans were walking out thinking that they were in the clouds as well that day. <laughs> but I'm gonna do a T C a podcast with T C game of my life when we're going to look back at the Boxing Day Massacre and I think we'll do Excellent. a little double because I think it was um, March time Easter time when they played United at Bramall Lane and TC took the ball in the corner went past about three or four United players and then just pinged it in the bag one of his best goals not his best goal but one of the best goals that he scored during his career his best goal was uh, for Forrest against Fulham away yeah yeah, and that ain't got a barrel of um, money. We mentioned it on the last month's mod- yeah, podcast. So I think we did. I don't know if you know what um, the reason for the name after it. I since found out it's a, it's a chant that's basically sang by uh, Sheffield United fans. Oh, right. Uh, which, in fact, I've got it written down here. I'm not going to sing it because I don't know how it goes, but it says, We ain't got a barrel of money. We ain't got Woodward and Curry, but with Eddie Colquane. Col- Col- yeah, Col- yeah, 10 yeah. and a half. Yeah, promotion is so united all together now, and it starts again. But uh, that's the idea. That's the name of the book. It comes from a yeah, from a chance uh, with Sheffield United fans. Jason Holly had his rights. He's a big, he's a lifelong Sheffield United fan. So, uh, um, but yeah, fascinating in terms of the highs and lows. Certainly, of those times, wasn't it for Sheffield United again? Yeah, uh, they suddenly come crashing down. So I mean, it could have been called the Chip Butty Book then as well, couldn't it? It could have been. Yes. Yeah. It's true. probably got a better ring to it. It ain't got a barrel of money. It's probably got a better <laughs> ring than a chip butty book. But, yeah, uh, yeah Tony Curry. Again, I've done a uh, Legends podcast with uh, with Tony Curry. Uh, what a fabulous yeah. guy and one of one of my heroes growing up. You know, tremendous listening to yep. TC recall his uh, memories of his glorious career. Not just for Sheffield United, but for Leeds and Watford he started off with and played for England, of course, and Queen's Park Rangers. Absolutely. Absolutely. Can I just give a shout back to Terry, Terry's book? Is that uh, Give Me the Ball that obviously they came out? Um, just going to shout out to the publishers, Bar- Morgan Lawrence Publish yeah. Services. Um, I've been lucky enough, they've sent me a couple of their books. Uh, 
all really good. Obviously, you've got to give me the ball, Terry Cummins, uh, and his first book, you know, Football Maverick, a brilliant read as well. But also from Morgan Lawrence, um, recently come out last last year, uh, they did an autobiography of Gary Mills. Yeah, so yeah. Young Millsy, My yeah. Life in Football. Yeah, John the really wrote done it. By, that's it, yeah. The forwards are from uh, Gary Bertels. So, um, yeah, so obviously... Um, so, it's anonymous in the East Midlands, obviously Leicester City, uh, Forest, Notts County, Derby County, etc. So, um, yeah, so that's Young Millsy. Another book from Morgan Lawrence that um, came out last year was Julian Jochen. Yep, Jochen. My Life in Football, You Must Be Jochen, if you remember him. Again, if you're still yeah. on YouTube, he was that quick. Unbelievable, oh, wasn't it? JJ was. He, he played at the Villa yeah. for a while. Mm. He did, yeah, mm-hmm. that's it. Well, uh, famously, I think I remember watching him actually at Filbert Street. Many years ago, and I remember yeah. thinking, "Crack, he can move." He had a blistering pace. So, um, but yeah, yeah that's I remember it. him destroying Birmingham for Leicester. One, then thinking, "Yeah, he can mm. move." <laughs> yeah, excellent. But he uh, he played at Villa, Cobb City, Warsaw. Uh, and he finished at Boston United and Leeds United. Sorry, in between that as yeah. well, uh, and also Dar- sorry, Darlington. Uh, I'm looking on here. So that's from Morgan Lawrence um, Publishing, and um, there seems to be a connection with Leicester. One of the books from that came from them. It was around about this time last year. It was called Minding My Own Football Business. So I actually did a review of this book. And that was Barry, on the website. Was it? Yeah, Barry Pierpoint. Yeah, so, yeah, uh, yeah. And it's a fascinating read. He was the Leicester City's first chief executive. Mm. So it's the inside story of Leicester City's success. And he was um, very much uh, forward-thinking. He, was, uh, he came from a marketing background, did Barry Pierpoint. So he brought that into the club. They did things like... Uh, uh, the Leicester fans will know all this. They did uh, family night football, uh, FNF family night football. It's um, at Leicester's old ground. Obviously, you had the stadium. Uh, you had the stand that was built. The Carlings. I think it was called the Carling Stand, if I remember rightly, when it was first built. Uh, and then Fox Leisure. They were one of the first teams to ever. A lot of clubs have got Umbro, Adidas, etc. They came up with their own uh, Fox mm-hmm. Leisure, which was a local uh, clothing company from Leicester. So, yeah, if you go back to see any of the pictures from when Steve Steve Walsh I think, celebrates in, um, scoring in the playoff final, you'll see on the Leicester tops, it's Fox Leisure. So, uh, very unique kind of thing. So, uh, but it's a really, really good book um, about his times there. Uh, and that's, again, from Morgan Lawrence. So, yeah, they've done a number of really good books. Uh, did, did they the do any fox hats? Year or so. Say it again, sorry? Did they wear any fox hats? Fox hats? <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, the, where, where's that then, sorry? What do you mean? I thought when the gaffer says, wear the fox hat. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> I see what you mean. Yes. No, I well, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, he was. Uh, he, he's got something to do with the publishing company, hasn't he? As well, Barry. Yeah, mm. yeah, I think he has. Yeah, yeah. But that was a good book. That last one I mentioned, interesting read. So uh, lots of nostalgia. And this is all before they moved over to um, the new grounds, at yeah, the Walker and... Stadium or King Power, as it's now known. Yeah, superb. Another book I just wanted to give a mention to is our Mister by Rory Smith. Looks at the pioneers of the game and tells the story of the men who taught oh, the world to play and shaped its destiny. So uh, that looks a, a great book as well, Mr. Boy Rory Smith. Yeah, that's, that's one of my favourites. Old and new, borrowed and yeah. new. And uh, yeah. well, I've got to mention The Smell of Football 2 by Mick Baz Rathbone. I've got, oh, his, yes. he, I've got his smell of football, but uh, and he's been promoting it on social meet, uh, social meters, social media as well. And uh, yeah. former former player of Birmingham City, who I believe he left Birmingham, went to Blackburn Rovers, and was he? I think he was a physio then, wasn't he, at, at Blackburn? And that's where yeah. the uh, smell of football come from, I believe. His his tales of um, his life and times in football, which you know. It would, and this is part two. So it was a great read, the first book, although I didn't read it. I have got it, but I didn't read it. But I'm sure this one will be... It was very popular. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it was very popular, the first book. Uh, yeah. It's famous, because on the front of it, the smell of football, it's the um, it's the, um, the cream, isn't it? Oh, it'll come back to me. What is it? The um, oh, I remember using it when I was playing football. It's the deep heat, deep heat kind of cream. Oh, we've got uh, a story on... about deep heat. 
Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so I, think, I think we'll have that one on the next podcast, the uh, Towels at Maverick's <laughs> Tell. And it'll be yeah. Tony Morley telling the story about um, uh, D. Pete, yeah. Bristol City dressing room, and Brendan mm. Orms being it's an absolute classic. Brilliant. Excellent. No, it's been, looking forward to uh, Nick Rathland, his second book. The first book was really good. Really, really good. Quite a character. Absolutely. Any other books that you want to give a mention to, sir, before we wrap up part five? Well, the, the only one I, I didn't mention, I, I missed it earlier, because it was on the free recommendation that I did in the newsletter. Uh, I mentioned um, the the other two, um, Can We Have a Football Back and Living on a Volcano? And the third one I um, recommended was The Names Heard Long Ago, which oh. is Jonathan Wilson. I know we've talked about Jonathan over the uh, few podcasts, but yeah, one of the great writers. But that, that book... Is fantastic. Really recommend that. It's the um, it's how the golden age of UK Hungarian football shaped uh, the modern game, and it's uh, it's a yeah brilliant read. It's um, uh, it's 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 all about the um, the history uh, of Hungarian football, but it's so much more than that. Really, I'm not, I can't really do it justice. It's one of those books. It really is one of those you have to read. In fact, he, he writes in the prologue. I remember writing down here. It says this is a football book. But it's also a book about courage and tragedy, about survival and death, about the horror of the Holocaust, um, the Soviet re- um, repression, and the awful choices that people had to make um, during and after the uprising of 1956. Um, but it's a fascinating book. Fifteen years in the making, it was, uh, for Jonathan Wilson, in between other great books he's done, Behind the Curtain, uh, amongst others, etc. Angels that was, uh, and Dirty Fancies. Yeah. yeah, Angels and oh, but another great book comes in Argentina. But um, yeah, this one, as it says on the back, a tour de force, um, revealing the soccer secret history of modern football. And uh, yeah, the list of obviously great names that you'll be fully aware of are the Mighty Magyars, um, well, from the time where uh, when they famously beat England, obviously at Wembley. So, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that earlier, so I did really want to give that a shout-out. I've mentioned it before, but I think it's worth mentioning again. It's a really, really good book. Well, that's not um, the way that you Wilson. mentioned two at the beginning. We finished hmm. on that third one, and it does lead us nicely to the last trilogy, because as you've talked about the name hmm. third long ago in 1956, and it was Hungary and Wolves that pretty much started the European Cup when they played each other after England had been beaten yeah. in uh, 53 and 54 by the Hungarians. Mm. Uh, the Hungarians then got beat in the World Cup final <clears> by <throat> West Germany um, in the battle, well, the miracle, the miracle of, uh, of Bern. Bern, yep. Yeah. And um, three books, a trilogy uh, by Stephen Cragg, the, uh, yeah. the European Cup, the undisputed champions of Europe. They say yeah. all of this European stuff didn't go on until England played <laughs> Hungary, and then Wolves played Honved, and then the, the the English were saying that we got our national pride back. The English game is the greatest game in the world, and in the yeah. Parisian papers they said it may be or it may not be. Let's have a tournament to si- to decide and to see who is the best club side in Europe. Mm. So that was mm. the uh, forerunner, really, of the European Cup. The undisputed champions of Europe, how the gods of football yeah. became European royalty. A, fro- a tournament frozen in time, the wonderful uh, randomness of the European Cup, Winners' Cup. And his other one was where the cool kids hung out, the shikiest yeah. of the UEFA Cup. And a fantastic trilogy there by Stephen Scrag. Great books. I love the th- I mean, just picking them up, it's absolutely fantastic. And I, oh, the one you. thing I love, I love all factual things in books as well. And uh, I didn't see any of the finals and the results, etc. So I uh, I got to the first cup and I wrote them all down from 1969 to 70 to 1979 yeah. to 80. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was fantastic. You know, Arsenal winning the uh, the first one yeah. of the decade, uh, 4-3 on aggregate beating Anderlecht. <clears throat> and then Leeds yeah. United winning in 1971 the Fairs Cup. 
and then Spurs the All English first All English European final. Liverpool beat Munchen Gladbach seventy three. Feyenoord beating Spurs four two on aggregate because it was a yeah. two legged final. Those were brilliant. The two legged final. Borussia Munchen Gladbach then Liverpool Juventus PSV Borussia again a nine track Frankfurt. I just love looking yeah. at the results and. Uh, you know, what a tournament. One of the great tournaments. Well, all three were great tournaments. They were. Not like what we've got now. Champions League, Europa League, and then some tin pot league. From the, conference. The, cha- the Champions League, which doesn't include necessarily the champions. Exactly, it's crazy. <laughs> Let's go back to yeah. the times when we had the European Cup, which was a great yeah. cup. The... Yeah. Cup winners. Cup. I don't think the names are even as good now. There's, I think it's on to the, where we're doing this now. Tonight you've got the Europa League, but I think you've got the you know, Europa Conference yeah, absolutely, Cup yeah. or something yeah, like that. Yeah, I think yeah. even, is it Brendan Rodgers, I think, said at Leicester. I think Leicester yeah. are playing in that tonight. Yeah, right, tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think he even knew what it was, did he? No. <laughs> he didn't even know there was a, such a competition which just said it all. It's just sounds like the mystique, like a European Cup Winners' Cup and UEFA Cup. Yeah. and Yeah. Well, it was what it said on the team, was I mean, this conference yeah. league, anybody that finishes seventh, I think, goes into that. I mean, they've only had it this year. It's a ridiculous competition. But back in <laughs> the European Cup, it was the winners of the league. The UEFA yeah. Cup was the runners up and down to fourth. And then the Cup yeah. Winners Cup was the Cup winners. Yeah, yeah. How simple can you get? Brilliant competitions. Yeah. And, they tell, and they try and tell me football is better these days. You're having a laugh. Well, it's some great winners. That European Cup winners call, which is the first one of that trilogy, you know, frozen in time. Yeah. You had the last Man City won it, didn't they? Uh, West Ham. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> frozen uh, in time. Cup winners cup, yeah. Cup winners cup. Sorry, yeah. yeah. Uh, Manchester. I'm sure. Yeah, Manchester City won it, 1970. Yeah, they Tottenham did. won it. West Ham. Uh, Chelsea. Yeah. And then you got yeah lots of other clubs, you know, from outside of England, Hamburg. Uh, sorry, 1860 Munich. I remember that one. 65. Uh, Aberdeen, of course, famously in Gothenburg in 83 against you can't Real miss, Madrid. You can't yeah. miss out Chelsea in 1971. When oh, of course. They, when yeah. they knocked out the, uh, the the reigning champions, Manchester City, in the, yeah. in the semi-final. And then they, uh, they run out winners against Real Madrid. Lovely stories that Alan Hudson tells about the Athens Hilton. Osgood, Charlie Cook and Sponge. <laughs> they really were <laughs> the kings of the King's Road. And uh, finally, I want to give a mention to my Bible, uh, Alan Hudson, the working man's ballet. And Brilliant. if it wasn't for a fortuitous email to Alan Hudson, I wouldn't be sitting here or standing here talking <laughs> to you today or doing any podcasts that I've ever done because they only really have fallen out of the stuff that I've done with Hoodie. So, um, yeah. yeah, and what a read, The Working Man's Ballet. One of the best titles for a book as well, isn't it, Gabby? Yeah, and, a, and a title given in to him by his mentor and second father, mm. Tony uh, Tony Waddington, what the God. Uh, what yeah. a different class of a manager. Um, Excellent. What, what, uh, what more can you say? No, absolutely. 17, 17 years manager of Stoke City, and in that time, the great and the good football all played at the Victoria Ground. It, it just, did. There, there's not many more romantic stories than what Tony Waddington did at uh, at Stoke City and what he'd done for Stoke City. A shame yeah. that Stoke City didn't reward him in the same way that he rewarded them, but that's football. Yeah, no, he had a who's who didn't he a footballer certainly at that time did Tony Waddington. Oh, what, what it's remarkable, is. isn't it? When you yeah. when you look at um Tony Waddington um and what he done at Stoke City, absolutely untrue. The players that he brought to the Potteries, it's phenomenal. Yeah. And we'll, yeah, uh, it I'm, was. Gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna start with um with the uh, the Wad because Tony uh, Alan wrote a, a book about Tony and that there are a number of other books about Tony Waddington. And I think I'm going to start with uh, with that on uh, next month's podcast. Excellent. Good okay. place to start. Yep. Brilliant. So thank you for your time, sir. Love to you and yours. Thanks, and thank you, everybody, uh, for listening. Excellent. Take care of yourself, everyone, and happy reading.
Absolutely, and I bet you I'll still be on page 105 of Grandad well, What's Football Like in the 70s by Richard we've got Thorpe. To, we've got to, we, maybe we should read part of it on the next podcast, Gabby, <laughs> together. We should uh, somehow read it to each other uh, for half an hour at least so we can move on you from, don't, that, uh, you don't from want, that page. You don't want me <laughs> reading out loud. A bit like a Kindle, you know, like they do uh, an Amazon Kindle. We can read it out together. So, uh, well, I put my turns, lack of reading and bad <laughs> reading down to when I was at school and in English all we done was argue about Birmingham City <laughs> and Aston Villa and we didn't I didn't read anything and I think it's because of that that's half of the reason I'm so bad at reading now I didn't do nothing in English when I was at school well but, you're, do, you're doing the right thing to remote books that's the main thing I guess then so at least we're doing that part. well God loves a so. try and my God I try <laughs> <laughs> excellent cheers thanks Andy until next time see you guys thank you bye 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 bye